Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Crime Weekly. I'm Stephanie Harlow. And I'm Derek Lavasser. So today's episode, we have a lot to cover. We have a lot to cover. It's it's going to be a lot of information. So before we do anything, I just want to give everyone who's listening right now a quick reminder that if you follow us on YouTube at Crime Weekly on, on YouTube, you will see that we're doing a separate segment that's not available on audio, and it's called Crime Weekly News, where we spend about 30 minutes every week talking about something that's in the headlines as far as true crime goes. And for the past two weeks, we've been discussing the University of Idaho murders. And with the probable cause affidavit just being released this past week, we did go over that and kind of give our opinions and get to hear what we think about that. So if you haven't seen it yet, head over to YouTube and make sure you subscribe to us there so that you get notified every week when we talk about, you know, Crime Weekly News. Yeah. And and for those of you who are asking, because there were a lot of you, you know, why isn't this on audio? To make it really simple, we have a deal with Audio Boom. We have a, a certain schedule that we put out episodes to add another uh, episode in the RSS feed. Kind of would screw up the scheduling that we have. So to uh, not complicate things right now, it's going to be specifically on YouTube, and it's going to be there for a while. So you definitely want to subscribe and turn the notifications on. Uh, down the road, yeah, sure, it'll probably be on audio, but for right now, YouTube's the place the place to get it and. Great episode this week talking about the affidavit and uh, breaking that down. So if you want to check it out, if you're looking for short form content, that's that's where you want to go. Absolutely. And, you know, like I already said, we got a lot to talk about today. Um, I'm really excited to dive in because we're talking about the autopsy. We're talking about blood spatter, all of that stuff where I felt like I needed five college degrees to even understand what I was reading, but I got through it and hopefully um, I I will be able to explain it to you. And then Derek can come in with his expertise as far as law enforcement goes, because I'm sure he already just kind of started off knowing more about blood spatter and things like that than I did. And it was it was tough for me, man. I was like real exhausted this week with all the, the information that was coming through, all the medical information. I felt stupid. I kept having to look stuff up. So hopefully I have it nailed down enough where we can have a, an intelligent discussion about it. But before we dive into today's episode, let's have a word from the sponsor of today's video, June's Journey. And I'm kind of pumped that Crime Weekly is working with June's Journey because I've actively been playing this mobile game for years, and I absolutely love it. June's Journey is a hidden object mystery game combined with this like really cool 1920s era murder mystery that you have to solve while you're finding these hidden objects. The game is free to download. It's just so visually stunning and engaging, and each new scene takes you further through this thrilling murder mystery story that follows our main protagonist, June Parker, as she goes on a quest to solve the murder of her sister and uncover her family's many secrets at the same time. I truly do enjoy everything about June's journey because it feels like an escape from the stresses of life, and you can really get lost in it because it's just so beautiful and fun and you know engaging. But it's very challenging at the same time. So I can breathe and kind of relax, but I'm also not mindlessly scrolling through social media. I could talk about June's journey for an hour, but I won't because, first of all, I don't want to spoil the story for you and tell you any of the Parker family secrets accidentally. And second of all, I really think that this is something you need to download for yourself and and check it out because only then will you get to see the beautifully colored and aesthetically pleasing scenes and feel that that thrill when you locate a hidden object you've been struggling to find. So trust me, go download June's Journey. It's free to download. It's awesome. And Derek's going to tell you how. That's right. Download June's Journey for free today by clicking the link in the description box below. June's Journey is available on Android and iOS mobile devices, as well as on PC through Facebook games. We want to thank June's Journey for sponsoring this week's episode. Let's dive into the case. All right, today's episode is going to be one that is dense with information and evidence from the autopsy report to the blood spatter analysis, and it would be this evidence that's introduced during the trial that expert witnesses would give their opinions on. Now, experts for the state, the prosecution, they testified that Kathleen Peterson's injuries were consistent with a beating, and experts for her husband, Michael Peterson, would testify that her injuries were more consistent 
with an accidental fall. And that is really something that I noticed as I was kind of listening to the trial and watching portions of the trial. The defense and their witnesses, they they won't like say anything with you know, with 100% certainty. They'll say like, hey, we can't tell you exactly what all of this evidence means. We weren't there, but we can tell you that reading this evidence makes us feel that the blood spatter and the scene are more consistent with an accidental fall, whereas the prosecution and their witnesses were like, oh, absolutely no way this could have been an accidental fall. This 100 million percent shows that that she was beaten by her husband, basically, right? Like, that's what they're saying. And um, it kind of did bug me a little bit because you really don't know what happened. Unless you were there, you can look at blood spatter and you can look at the scene and, and the injuries on Kathleen and you can say as somebody who has um, some knowledge of these things, it looks like this is what may have happened. But the prosecution was really going hard with their witnesses who, I mean, spoiler alert, we find that that some of their expert witnesses weren't as you know, much expert as they were witness, but they went really hard with kind of just saying this, this absolutely could not have been an accidental fall in a million years. And, and that kind of bugged me a little bit and rubbed me the wrong way. Yeah. I feel like the prosecution's trying to tell a story where the defense isn't necessarily trying to prove what they believe. They're just trying to put different ideas out there to create this level of doubt in the minds of jury members. Again, it's not their job to prove it 100%. It's just to say, Hey, Here's an alternative. And if this alternative is even potentially true, well, that could rise to the level of reasonable doubt. And if that's the case, well, then you have to find our, our client not guilty. That's all they're trying to do. So it's definitely frustrating. I agree with you 100 percent, but they're doing what they're getting paid to do. The defense or the prosecution? Well, the prosecution doesn't get paid nearly as much. They're trying to put on a story, but the defense, they get paid a lot of money to create that reasonable doubt, to create just a, an uncertainty in the minds of jury members where all you need is a couple of them to say, yeah, if, I, if you made me choose, he's probably guilty. However, because of these other pl you know possible scenarios, I just can't get there. That's all the defense needs. And that's why the best are, are, are the best for the re are a reason. They're not... They're not proving innocence. They're just creating doubt. Absolutely. Um, and I think that we do kind of look when we're when we're watching trials like this, we look at the defense and their lawyers and then we look at the prosecution and their lawyers and each side's experts. And we almost are biased towards the prosecution where it's like, oh, well, you you expert witnesses are on the side of like the truth. And then the defense expert witnesses are kind of like just trying to do and, and tell whatever they're paid to tell. They're just trying to build a narrative. That That is typically how I do look at a trial. And I think how a lot of people look at a trial. But in this trial, I was uncomfortable doing that because I did feel that a lot of the witnesses on the prosecution side we're saying things and doing things that just didn't make sense, even as as a layman, as somebody who didn't know what the hell was happening. And when you slap the title of expert on somebody, it does sometimes give you a feeling that like, well, what do I know? I'm just a stupid, stupid person walking around. This is the expert. I know what he's doing right now doesn't make sense to me and it doesn't seem right, but he is the expert. And I think we do have to get away from that and start thinking a little bit more critically because as I get into it and I tell you more about Dwayne Deaver, which we're not going to really dive into his mess until next episode. We're going to touch on it today. But as we dive more into that, you'll see that like he was doing some things, <laughs> some experiments and stuff that I remember everyone was like, well, this is weird. It doesn't really make a lot of sense. But He's the expert. So, like, mm. who are we to question him? We need to start using some more critical thinking here. Yeah, well, I, there's a lot of expert witnesses out there. There's a lot of criticism that come with expert witnesses because it's very subjective, right? There's not the standard that you have to pass in order to be an expert witness. It's just they qualify you based on your experience. And if the t defense team or prosecution feels you're qualified, that's that's what it is. And they ha they'll have to put out your qualifications in court. But Again, it's not going to stop you from testifying. I will say prosecution, defense, whatever side you're on, these expert witnesses get paid a lot and they charge a lot for their, their research and their experiments, whatever they're doing outside of court so that they're, they're caught up on the case to testify under oath. And generally how it works is you'll have 
prosecution or defense, whatever side you want to come from, they'll interview five or six uh, expert witnesses. They'll get their overall assessment of the case just based on the preliminary information they know, and they will go with the person who fits their narrative the most. Now, in some situations, you may say that the expert witnesses know what the prosecution or defense is looking for, so they'll tailor their opinions to that. Who am I to say that's not the case, especially when you have all this money riding on it? But essentially, they're not wrong either way because that's what you're saying. You have two people who are considered both experts, and yet they have completely differing opinions. And so what it really comes down to in trial, in my opinion, is not only who's the expert as far as their experience, but how they're able to convey that opinion. Because the person who's more convincing to a jury is probably going to be the one they believe. And that person may not have as much experience as the other person. But if they're a, if they're a, someone who is a showman, it's it's almost more important than the actual foundation of their expertise. I completely agree with you. And you do see some of that in, in this case and in this trial. I mean, we've seen it before. Like, look at Casey Anthony and things like that. They had a lot of expert witnesses that were showmen. And sometimes the attorneys themselves can be showmen. And, you know, we talked about Dr. Henry Lee a little bit last episode, but he does kind of get a couple jabs in and here in this trial. And um, I got a little bit of a laugh out of it. But either way, the first person from the medical examiner's office to see Kathleen's body and to give an opinion on what had happened to her was Dr. Kenneth Snell, who viewed the body at the Cedar Street home around 7.40 a.m. on December 9th, 2001. After this, Dr. Snell filled out an initial field report, and in this report, Snell wrote that he determined the probable cause of Kathleen's death was a closed head blunt force injury to the head due to an accidental fall down the stairs. Now, Snell claimed that to him, it looked as if Kathleen had hit her head on the top step above the corner. She had then hit the floor in the corner of the stairs and landed at the base of the stairs on her back. Now, this initial field report is just what it sounds like, the first impression of a medical professional on the scene before the victim's body was taken away for an autopsy. On that same morning, Dr. Snell had been speaking to a police officer on the scene, and apparently this police officer had some experience with blood spatter analysis. And this police officer told Dr. Snell that it appeared Kathleen may have hit her head on the stairs more than once. And Dr. Snell agreed that from what he could see, the blood spatter evidence supported the theory that Kathleen had died from an accidental fall and hit her head on the stairs. However, Snell could only see two distinct lacerations on Kathleen's scalp. And because her hair was matted with blood, he decided that an autopsy needed to be done so that the rest of the head could be examined. Later, Dr. Kenneth Snell would change his mind about it being accidental after watching some of the autopsy and reading the autopsy report. And during the trial, Snell said, quote, any of this information may not be correct. It's quite routine. That information in this report gets changed in some fashion. I filled it out before the autopsy had even begun, end quote. Snell was asked by the then district attorney Jim Harden if this was his practice to fill out the report before the autopsy was complete, and Snell responded, quote, not currently. I feel now that it's better to wait until I have at least the preliminary autopsy findings, end quote. And Dr. Snell basically said he decided to do this to wait until the preliminary autopsy findings before filling out his report because it would cause less problems for law enforcement. And Michael Peterson's lawyer, David Rudolph, who also talked to Dr. Kenneth Snell about his initial findings, he asked him, quote, when you say problems, it causes law enforcement. This was an honest opinion you gave at the time, wasn't it? It was what you believed at the time, end quote. Dr. Snell agreed that the opinion he gave in the initial report was what he genuinely believed at the time, and the suggestion was made that maybe Dr. Snell had switched his opinion due to pressure from the police and from the DA's office. But um, I don't find this to be super suspicious. You know, a lot of people, you know, who are like kind of pro Michael Peterson do kind of make a big deal about this. Um, we're going to talk about the medical examiner who did Kathleen's autopsy, Dr. Radish. And, and we're going to talk about, you know, there's some evidence that she kind of got some pressure and changed her opinion. To me, that's a little bit more impactful. Dr. Snell showed up. He saw what he saw with his own two eyes, which you can't get a a really – um, accurate determination of what wounds Kathleen has uh, or or if there's damage underneath 
the wounds, if there's damage to the skull or to the brain, you can't really get an idea of what kind of impact could have caused those wounds when you're just looking with what you can see with your eyes. So if he made an initial determination based on only what he could see, and it wasn't what the autopsy ended up, you know, agreeing with, that to me, that's not a big deal. No, I agree with you. And it happens often. We have situations where we'll respond to a scene. And in some instances, it's an, an elderly person where uh, it doesn't appear that there were any signs of foul play. It just seems like they pass in their sleep. We always have to call the ME. They, we can give them the findings over the phone or what were the observations we're seeing, some of the specifics, the health conditions of the person. Uh, usually they'll want medication bottles in the house. We'll relay that all to them and they'll make a determination as to whether or not they're going to come out to the crime scene. Uh, in many instances, they don't. Uh, but if you have a situation where it's at all questionable about the death in the person, a healthy person, and Emmy is usually going to come out and they're going to do exactly what you said. They're going to have their preliminary observations about the, the body. And it's purely just surface level, just basically what they can see. It's not until they get in there during the autopsy when they're going to get to the actual findings and the, a more definitive conclusion as to what they think happened. So yeah, it's pretty much, I feel that's pretty standard and I'm with you. I don't have an issue with it, but just back to what we had said earlier, this is where there's a practice. It's nothing nefarious. And the defense doesn't necessarily have to prove that it is. They just have to bring it up and just kind of put it out there into the stratosphere, into the world so that the jury members can hear it and they'll ponder it and they'll think about it. Maybe some of them will latch on to it. Maybe they won't, but it doesn't hurt the defense to bring it up and just to throw it out there as a possible idea. And maybe that's something that that stays with them throughout the trial. I will say, though, this case has been putting me through the ringer. It's been really stressing me out because what I've been doing is I've been going through it from like the prosecution's angle, you know, from like, oh, Michael Peterson's guilty. I go through it from their angle. And, you know, depending on how you're looking it up online, you can find everything from each person's perspective, from each yep. side. And so I'll go through it like that. And then I'm like, oh, he's guilty of sin, man. He definitely did this. And then I go through it the other side and I'm like, oh, well, shit, they didn't say that. I didn't know that. And then I'm going back and forth and it's torture. Honestly, it's torture because it's very clear, like even the reporting on this case is very biased and slanted depending on who's doing the reporting and I just don't I don't know how we can continue to live in a world where we can't get on the same page about the most basic of things, you know, and I feel like on this, like I will say initially I was like, OK, this whole um, what is his name? Dwayne Deaver. I was like, it's not as big of a deal as everybody's making it out to be. Right. Because I had read some um, reports from other Emmys or other like. Uh, experts in the blood spatter field and they were like well we don't really see what he did wrong you know we wouldn't have done anything differently but then i really looked deeply at the experiments he did and i was like this does not make any sense why he's doing these experiments am i the stupid one and then i started looking deeper and i was like no i'm not the stupid one this experiment doesn't make any sense but you've got other experts you know quotations experts who are like oh he did everything exactly right and i'm like there's no way he did everything exactly right so it's just like sometimes you will choose a side even if you don't have any specific motive to do so you just align with people who are like you and i think people in the scientific community who were also like Dwayne deaver or doing his job were like well we got to kind of like line up behind this guy because he could be any of us we could be under the microscope in the future so we would want our community you know, the scientific experts to to band behind us. And it's very difficult. You have to really like put everything aside and listen to this sounds stupid, but listen to like your instinct and your heart when you're looking at these things and say, does this feel right or does it feel wrong? And a lot of this felt wrong. So all that that I just said to you will bring us right back to where I still don't know where I stand. And like, I feel like I'm so far into this by now, I should have a better feeling about it by this point. Uh, I don't I don't necessarily think so. I think we've covered some basic stuff. You know, we've talked about I shouldn't even say basic, some detailed stuff. But so back to what you were just saying, it's kind of like our society as a whole right now, whether it's true crime or not, depending on what you choose to believe is the side what you believe personally is the side you're going to go with. You can see it in politics every day. People are very one sided. They're very biased. And a lot of the country's divided red and blue. Right. It doesn't even matter who the person is, what their backgrounds are, if they're 
If they're a, a certain political party, you're supporting them. <laughs> that's just the way it is. And I feel like that it's that's a more macro level, but we have it in true crime as well, where if you're going into it and you believe that the person's guilty or innocent, it's going to be very hard to sway you if you truly believe that, regardless of the evidence that's put in front of you. So I do think you're right. You got to use some instinct. You got to use some common sense. And I feel like all we can do is kind of relay the facts as we as we see them and allow you guys to come to your own conclusions. Yeah, but sometimes it's hard to find those facts through all of the noise, you know, like to find the actual fact, not the fact that's been presented and and colored and slanted before you even see it. Right. And that's why you really have to, like, watch these trials. And some people won't do it because it does get boring. Like maybe five percent of a trial is interesting and the rest is just like. What's your what's your education level like? How long have you worked for the ME's office? And it's like 30 minutes of somebody just talking about nonsense before they even get into the the actual flesh of their testimony. So it can get boring and you can tune out, but you really have to listen to the raw data and, and compute from there. But I do want to talk about the actual autopsy that was done at the office of the chief medical examiner at Chapel Hill. And that was performed by Dr. Deborah Radish. But before we do that, let's take a quick break. We'll be right back. Most of you have probably heard me sing the praises of Pros, the world's most personalized hair care. Now, switching to a custom routine from Pros has definitely been one of the best things I've done for my hair. And I want to tell you about the incredible results that I'm seeing since using my customized Pros products, mainly I've noticed a difference in manageability and consistency. I really did feel like I used to be at the whim of my hair. I could have a good hair day or a bad hair day, but it wasn't really under my control. Like it was just whatever my hair felt like doing. And now the texture of my hair is so much softer and smoother. It feels stronger. There's less breakage and it just seems to be more consistently a good hair day. Pros knows that there's more to you than just your hair type. And that's why they've given over 1 million consultations with their in-depth hair quiz. And that's exactly how I got started. Some of the quiz questions are straightforward and kind of like what you expect to be asked, but some of the questions are a little bit more surprising. Like they asked me what a single strand of my hair felt like or what my diet was like. And that's because those things matter. What you eat, where you live, how much damage your hair has sustained, that all makes your hair's needs unique from everyone else's. By analyzing over 85 personal factors, Pros determines a unique blend of ingredients to treat your exact concerns, and they handpick clean ingredients that get you closer to your hair goals with every wash. Best of all, Pros has a review and refine feature so you can tweak your formula for any reason, like if you moved from someplace humid to someplace more dry, or you went from being brunette to a blonde. And as a carbon neutral certified B Corps, Pros is an industry leader in clean and responsible beauty. All their ingredients are sustainably sourced, ethically gathered, and cruelty free. They're also the first beauty brand to go carbon neutral. If you're not 100% positive that Pros is the best hair care you've ever had, they'll take the products back, no questions asked. I love Pros and what it's done for my hair. We think you will too. Derek's going to tell you how you can check Pros out for yourself and get started with the quiz. Pros is the healthy hair regimen with your name all over it. Take your free in-depth hair consultation and get 15% off your first order today. Go to pros.com slash crime weekly. That's P-R-O-S-E dot com slash crime weekly for your free in-depth hair consultation and 15% off. Okay, we're back. Let's dive into this autopsy, the results from the autopsy done on Kathleen Peterson. Dr. Radish found that Kathleen had strands of her own hair grasped tightly in both her right and left hand. Additionally, there was dried blood found on the bottom of both Kathleen's feet, as well as dried blood on her face. And there was a small splinter of wood that was located in the hair at the back of Kathleen's head. And just based on what we know, this splinter of wood could have come from the stairs that Kathleen may or may not have fallen down, or from a possible instrument or weapon of some sort that was used to beat her if she in fact died from being beaten. Kathleen's nail beds were intact, and there was blood crusted beneath them, but there was no tissue found under her nails. So usually, if you would see in an autopsy, some broken or cracked nails might suggest that the victim was attacked and that they had fought back. But in this case, Kathleen's nails were not broken or cracked, 
And although she did have blood underneath them, she didn't have any tissue underneath them. So once again, we can look at this piece of evidence from both angles. The lack of tissue under Kathleen's nails could be viewed as her not being attacked because she didn't have these telltale signs of fighting back. This could also mean that she had her own blood under her nails because she accidentally fell down the stairs and she injured herself and she got blood under her nails maybe when she was trying to move away from the base of the stairs, maybe clawing at the ground, trying to get help, or maybe she even touched her own head and her face wounds trying to determine herself how badly injured she was. The lack of tissue under her nails combined with the blood under her nails and the hair clutched in her hands, it could also signify that she was being attacked or beaten with something. And so she pulled her arms and her hands to, you know, basically cover her face and her head to protect herself from an attacker. And, you know, if she was doing that and she had her hands kind of curled, her arms kind of curled in front of her face and her hands covering the top of her head, she may have like, you know, closed her fists and that's how she got her own hair in her hands. Moving on to the wounds on Kathleen's body, starting with her head, the autopsy revealed at least seven distinct lacerations on the posterior scalp or the back of her head. An internal examination of the head revealed a slight subarachnoid hemorrhage primarily over the left parietal and occipital lobes of the brain. However, there were no subdural hemorrhages present, there were no contusions on the brain, and no skull fractures present. So as a quick review, this means that there was bleeding inside the skull. But how deep did that bleeding go? Under the skull bone, everyone has a protective membrane that surrounds the entire brain, and this is called the dura mater. If injury or hemorrhage is seen on the dura mater and it's the part of the membrane that's facing the skull bone, it's referred to as an epidural hemorrhage. Now, if it's on the portion that faces the brain, it's called a subdural hemorrhage. Under the dura mater is the brain itself. The arachnoid mater is the visible outer layer of the brain, and the subarachnoid space is located between the arachnoid mater and the pia mater. So all three of these, the dura mater, the arachnoid mater, and the pia mater are considered meninges, like the three membrane layers that cover and protect your brain and your spinal cord. So Kathleen had a slight subarachnoid hemorrhage, which means there was bleeding in the space that surrounds the brain, but there were no brain contusions, no skull fractures, no subdural hemorrhage. Now, the most common reason you would see a subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is what Kathleen had, is when a blood vessel on the surface of the brain bursts and leaks. And this can happen for various reasons, but it's most often caused by head trauma, such as from a serious fall or an automobile accident. Kathleen also had several wounds on her face, including three contusions over the right eyelid that were one quarter inch by one quarter inch, a contusion of the same size on her right ear helix. So the helix is the place where you'd get like a little cuff on your ear if you got your ear pierced. It's kind of like in the cartilage area. There was also three linear horizontal abrasions over her left eyebrow, a small linear abrasion on the right side of her nose, a horizontal contusion over the bridge of her nose followed by a skip area, and then a one inch by one half inch vertical contusion over the dorsum of her nose. She also had a small abrasion over her lip and two small linear horizontal abrasions inferior to her left eye. Now, all trauma to Kathleen's head and face was described as blunt force trauma. None of the injuries are described as sharp force injury. A sharp force injury would result from stabbing or slicing, you know, a knife or something. So even though these um, wounds on Kathleen's head were described as lacerations, and sometimes people just associate the word laceration with some sort of cutting instrument, you can get a laceration from blunt force by hitting your head on something hard enough. In fact, I have a scar on my head from blunt force trauma to my head where um, I had to get stitches, but it, it literally sliced my head open and then it bled so much. So none of these injuries are sharp force injury. Um, and while there was some lacerations on Kathleen's skull, the injuries to her face and body were only described as contusions or abrasions, not lacerations, meaning just scrapes and bruises on her face 
and on her body. Now on Kathleen's back, there was a fairly large 3-inch by 3-inch contusion with a central pressure mark found over her left scalpula or shoulder blade. She also had abrasions on her left elbow, two linear short abrasions over the base of her index finger, a contusion over her left thumb, and a contusion on her left hand over the first digit as well as a lateral left wrist contusion. There were also some contusions on her right elbow, hand, and wrist. And on the back of her right hand, there were two pine needles found. So it looked as if the contusions and abrasions to Kathleen's body happened just to the back of her arms and hands. And her facial injuries were the only real damage done to the front of her body. So if you look at um, the autopsy pictures, you know, the ones that they kind of put in the autopsy and they, they mark where these wounds are, it shows a very distinct pattern, which is she does have some injuries to her body, but basically just from the waist up. There's no bruises, contusions, or anything on her legs. Um, and on when on her body itself, like on the trunk of her body, there's just these abrasions and things on the back, on her backside, and on the back of her arms and hands. So this is showing a pattern. Once again, when you move to her head, all of those lacerations are pretty much to the top back of her head. So the only real damage you see to the front of her body is these abrasions and contusions on her face. Yeah, it's a lot to take in there. I've written it all down. I think what my takeaway from this point, just up to this little section here, and I know you have more to go, is on the surface, if it were an assault with a blunt force object like a like a bat or a, a wrought iron poker or something like that, I would expect that these the injuries would be more severe. On the surface... If you were to tell me these injuries without the backstory of this case, I would say that this person, like, let's say I didn't even know they died. I would say that this person was in a fight, like a fist fight, or they fell down something like a set of stairs or something. Just the way, because your body, the way you would go down, you kind of tumble down the stairs and we've all fallen down the stairs. I actually had a pretty hard fall down the stairs a couple of years ago and I rolled over my, my body and most of my, the pain the next day was in my neck, my head and my shoulders, even though my legs hit the stairs too, but it's just the way your body kind of naturally whips over on itself. So on the surface, not knowing any of the context, this sounds like, I don't want to undersell it, but it sounds like I would, I would see more. And he would, he, if he was assaulting her, he wouldn't be able to control the, the, the forces to the front of her face so that they would only be abrasions. It would be all or nothing. That's just my initial thought as I'm just hearing you go through everything. So if you took a tumble down the stairs like that, though, would you expect to see so much damage to the head but so little damage to the face? Or would you expect to see any damage to the face if you were going down kind of on your back? Like, that's kind of my question. Like, why is all of this damage to the back, which would be consistent with, I think, a fall down the steps? But how did she get these contusions and these uh, abrasions and things on her face at all? Like, where did that happen? So only personal experience. And I'll give you the quick story. I, as you know, I like to build like electronics and, 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 uh, clocks and all these things. I like to solder stuff. So you wear like these special glasses, like magnifying glasses that like really, so you can solder the stuff really close. And I had it on the lowest, like magnification. uh, I should say the highest. It wasn't very magnified. It was just a little bit distorted. So I had the glasses on and I was running downstairs to grab some more butane fuel for my soldering iron. And, and I was at the top of the stairs. My stairs have a little bit of a turn. It was at this house and I was stepping on the stairs. And because my vision was a little distorted from the mag- magnification, yes, I don't know why I didn't take the glasses off. I, I don't know, but I misjudged the step. And the best way I can describe it is like my foot went to land on it because I thought I was there and I was a little bit forward. So my foot completely, completely missed the step and I went right over. And I can tell you definitively all the weight went on the top of my head. On the first, I, I actually went two times. I, I I flipped over twice before I got to the bottom, and all the pain that I had, and it, and I, I'm pretty sure I had a concussion, was at the top of my skull because literally I went over the first time, hit the top of my head. Yeah, you guys can laugh at me. And on the second pass, I hit my back on the back of the stairs, and then on the final landing, I hit the front of like the front of my head here, but there was nothing on my face, so I can't really explain the abrasions. I mean, she could have obviously felt much differently than I had fallen, but I want to go back to something because you said it and I believe it was last episode. I haven't heard anyone really throw out the theory 
that she could have fallen down the flight of stairs. Everyone who kind of brought it up, I think you said it was like, oh, maybe she was walking up and fell backwards. I don't see how she would have these many, th this amount of injuries from just falling down a few stairs. If this was the flight of stairs that we're talking about here, I don't think there's any way she sustains those injuries without starting at the top of the stairwell and going all the way down on her head and her back and then ending at the bottom of the stairway. That's the only way, and I'm not a biomechanical engineer, but I, I, that those injuries look like that was multiple impacts with the stairs if that's what happened. Well, yeah, no matter which expert you talk to, you know, whether it's Michael's experts or the state's experts, they agree that there's multiple impacts. Um, the state's experts don't believe she fell down the stairs right, at all, right? Exactly. They believe she was yep. attacked at the base of the stairs and then fell forward on top of the stairs. I think it's probably uh, something to do with maybe the the blood. Like, I don't think that there was as much blood or hardly any blood found at the top of the stairs. You wouldn't expect um, but that, But right? There wouldn't be, right? Yeah, no, <laughs> there you get wouldn't injured be. and then wherever she's resting is where the blood's going to be. But I'm sure you might see like maybe something like if her head made impact with like crown molding or something or like yeah. the, the molding on the ground, you might see like a spot of blood there. But once again, even blood spatter isn't a perfect science. And, you know, they will try to make you feel like it is like, oh, the blood tells a story. They kept saying, you know, the blood tells you what happened. But that's that's not necessarily true, especially when you're working backwards the way that that these blood spatter experts or Dwayne Deaver was working backwards from like, I think this is what happened and this is how I'm going to show it did happen because I already think that this is what happened. So when you're doing that, when you're working backwards, you you really can't get an idea and you're not listening to the blood or letting the blood sort of guide you. You're you're letting the the theory guide the what the blood's telling you. And honestly, like if you look at these pictures, there was a mess. There was blood all over the place. And I don't think anybody, anybody's theories explained where all that blood came from. So did she fall all the way down the stairs? It's possible. But yes, you're right. Nobody really kind of played with that theory or kind of brought that one to the forefront. Not that it's going to matter now, but I don't see how it wouldn't be possible that she was in the house for a couple, you know, even five minutes before him where she she goes upstairs for a second. Maybe there were no signs that she had been upstairs, but maybe she went upstairs and then realized, oh shit, you know what? I want to go downstairs and do this for a second. And so she's rushing back down the stairs to go turn off something or whatever. And she misses a step and boom, it's over. Like that could have easily have happened. So I don't, it's interesting that that was never brought up as a possible defense for Michael. Like, hey, there's a possibility here that she was at the top of the stairs and it would explain multiple tumbles where you have these different impacts and yet you don't have any serious injuries to the face where, and you would expect that in an attack. It's all to the back, but you have these light abrasions on the front where, again, I don't know how that would be the case. If, if he was impacting her even from behind me, I guess before her head hits the stairs, then you could have those light abrasions. It just seems like a lot of there would be some severe blows and then some controlled blows to the front or to, I guess, to the from the stairs to cause it. I'll just say right on the surface, it seems more consistent with a fall down the stairs than an attack right now. We're very early. I'm not saying that's how I'm going to feel at the end of this episode or by the end of the series, but just on the surface where we are right now, I feel like it's more in line with an accidental fall than an assault. That's just where I am at this moment. All right. Let's continue on with the autopsy and then tell me if you still feel that way after hearing the of course, rest, right? absolutely probably going to change. But right now, I don't think I don't know if there's gonna be many people who are looking at that piece of information saying, oh, yeah, 100 percent he killed her. Yo, people do. Do people absolutely? Of course. Look at I that. get it. I yeah. get it. I get it. But I, I mean, you know, it'd be great. I know I asked you last episode about the biomechanical engineer, but we'll get into it more. I know we have a lot more to cover. All right. So what you also saw in Kathleen's autopsy was she had a fracture of the left superior cornu in the thyroid cartilage in her neck. And this causes some people to believe that Kathleen was strangled. So the thyroid cartilage is a piece of pretty pliable bone and it protects the front neck organs like your larynx um, or your voice box. The superior cornu is the arm that extends off the thyroid cartilage. And in Kathleen, this was the area that was fractured and there was also associated bleeding around it. Now, damage to this area could suggest 
that Kathleen was strangled or choked because, according to the autopsy podcast, quote, that area of the neck is somewhat protected structure, not usually prone to blunt impact forces. Mm. It's one of those occasions where the pathologist cannot necessarily prove one way or another, so they simply document it and leave it at that, end quote. Now, of course, there's always a chance this area could be damaged from a fall down the stairs. But as far as I can tell, honestly, it is in instances of choking or strangling that are the most likely, you know, things to cause fractures in the thyroid cartilage. That's that's what I as far as I could tell when I was looking up these injuries, that was usually what was associated with them. But anything's possible. You know, we can't once again rule out that she may have fallen in a certain way when she's taking a tumble down the stairs where that part of her neck would be damaged or fractured. Yeah, it could be a freak accident. It it might be the definition of a freak accident. It doesn't line up logically, but it's exactly what it is. But I, I do I do concede that point, too, where I know – I don't know if it's the same bone. I'm not an expert in this area, but I know with the hyoid bone, when you see that as far mm-hmm. as being fractured, that usually is a sign of compression on the neck and during a strangulation. The hyoid bone was fine, though. There's no mention of it in the so autopsy, which is – So this is a different is, bone. Yes. It's um underneath that bone. Okay. So the hyoid bone is a little bit higher, I believe. The superior cornu is, I believe, kind of like in this general area. No yeah. one can see me if you're if you're watching, if you're listening on audio. But the hyoid bone was not mentioned in the autopsy, which leads me to believe that there was nothing to say about it, right? Nothing to say about it. And I, I will say that I, I would expect that if the bone underneath the hyoid bone is fractured, you would see some signs of strangulation around her neck afterwards. Right. You would see some signs of some t- whether it's a ligature or handprints, you would see something to suggest um, that she was strangled. Or maybe, I don't know if you're going to get there, we're not all the way through, uh, petechial hemorrhaging in the eyes that would suggest strangulation. So the lack of these things to me would would go more towards the side of freak accident. But you know, nevertheless, it could be either or, depending on how you want to interpret it. No petechial hemorrhaging in her eyes. Doesn't definitively rule it out, but those are also things you would see with strangulation and, and we don't have those. Exactly. Um, so, and I mean, you know, you could also say that maybe it was fractured, not from like a strangulation to the point of loss of oxygen, but some sort of like struggle, some sort of, um, you know, interaction, some fight that that somebody's hands were around her neck, but not tightly enough to to cause the oxygen to not reach, you know, to, to stop the oxygen to cause the petechial hemorrhaging. You may, you may, you could say that is yeah, all I'm saying. Yeah, it just saying. started with it. Yeah. And, and yeah. It's possible. Yeah, it's possible. But with that amount, of, if, if it's breaking, if fracturing bones, you would think there would be some form of uh, asphyxiation there that would cause that, but... Yo, right? That's what I'm saying. Like, if it's a fracture, then it sounds like it could be like you fell down the stairs. And this staircase... It's like an old staircase, you know, it's the it's if that house was like a an old timey like mansion when people still had servants, that would be the servants staircase. It's narrow. Um, it's like twisty. You can see a twist at the bottom and there's a lot of sharp edges going on there with the wall and the stairs themselves. So if she hit her neck just right on a stair or on like the corner of a wall, I, I would assume you could you know, cause a fracture of that cartilage. Yeah, I would think so too. That it, it, is that fracture, could it be suggestive that even her head was just bent a certain way? It might not have been a direct impact, but just by her neck contorting a certain way, it would fracture that bone as opposed to the hyoid bone. Yeah, and we're going to talk about um, different theories of what happened with that. Well, basically, there's only two theories. There's the people, the prosecution, which is like, oh, this is a sign she was strangled. And I believe the defense, I'll get into a little bit more detail, but I I believe they said that they thought this could be a postmortem injury, that this could have happened postmortem during the autopsy. The the fracture. Correct. Oh, interesting. While they're examining the body. Yeah, that that would make sense, too. I guess that that could be that does happen. Sometimes you have injuries because I will tell you, we're not going to go into we could do it another day on a live or something, but autopsies are the absolute worst to be present for i as a detective i hated them they were the they the smells the sights the sounds uh it's one of the few times in my career where i've had to run to the bathroom and and vomit because it's terrible what happens during those autopsies and when you're as a detective you you're supposed to be present for it sometimes the pathologist will let you watch from behind the glass but I, you know, new young detective, I'm going to be right in there. I can handle this. 
I was not ready. I was not prepared for the sounds and smells that come with the, and it's very, it's very aggressive. It's very violent what they have to do to get inside the body. Uh, and you can look it up. It's, it's so very easy to, to, to damage other parts of the body while conducting that autopsy. Yeah, I agree. And I mean, once again, not saying that that's certainly what happened here. I'm just saying people are only human. They make mistakes. And like you said, I agree. I've seen, you know, I haven't seen an autopsy performed, but I have seen. Um, lucky. Yeah. And not in person, but I've seen like video footage of of certain parts of it. And sometimes it feels like they're just like tearing this body apart, like like breaking bones and things. And yeah. it's it's very um that's probably what you mean about the sounds and probably the drills and things that sound the drill going into bone. Like I just remember the first time I heard that it was like goosebumps immediately. It was definitely not prepared for it. Um, So, yeah, I could see with sometimes the the amount of force that has to be applied by the the pathologist to do what they have to do you could accidentally fracture the bones in the in the surrounding area i would love to know how strong that bone we're not doctors right so we're just speculating but i would love to know how easy it is to fracture that bone and you know has that happened in previous autopsies before where you have situations where this particular bone is fractured during autopsies or is this the first time it has ever happened if it did happen that way? You know what I mean? Like, is it a common thing for in that field? It, it does seem like it happens during autopsy sometimes. OK, well, so that gives some more gives some more credence to it. Yeah. And I mean, it's it's like a cartilage, you know, so it's yes, it's a it's a bone, I guess. But it's, you know, cartilage. It's more pliable and, and things like that. It's okay. less rigid. Um, so I guess it, it depends. But yes, I did read. Because I had to look into that because, once again, I don't know. Um, I did read that that it does happen sometimes during autopsies. Okay. Well, that, again, gives a little bit more uh, possibility to it where it's not like, oh, if this did happen, it would be the first time in the history of autopsies that it, it makes it a lot less uh, believable if that were the case. Yo, know, if <laughs> because I, did, I think it was the defense, um, one of the defense experts who said something like that. And you always have to keep that in mind, you know, wh- wh- like consider the source, right? That's why I looked it up because I'm like, well, you could just be saying that. But also you would expect in that landscape too, like the prosecution or one of the prosecution's experts would be like, false. No, that's not true. That doesn't happen. That's incredibly rare. And it only happens in these circumstances. So nobody challenged that during the trial. And I looked it up myself and, and did see that it that it sometimes happens um, okay. during autopsy. So, I mean, it's not out of the realm of possibility. But once again, is that absolutely what happened? We don't know. We just have these theories that are posited and we have to figure out which one's the more likely one. Again, go back to our theme, right? This is a possibility, but it doesn't mean it necessarily happened. However, that doesn't matter. Just merely throwing it out there like, hey, this could be signs of strangulation or it could be just due to an autopsy being conducted aggressively. Whatever the jury member decides to believe, that's up to them. But by throwing out that alternate theory, it makes them think. Yeah. But you you know, you always say, like, it's not about what you know. It's about what you can prove. Mm -hmm. It just feels like nobody can prove any of this stuff. You know, like even somebody in the comments was like, wait, did she fall down the stairs or up the stairs? You said both. And I'm like, how do I know? We weren't there. (laughs) You know, Michael Peterson told the 911 operator she fell down the stairs. His defense experts gave the theory that maybe she was going up the stairs and that's how she kind of fell and and hit herself and then fell backwards and hit her head. But when no one was there to see it, even Michael Peterson himself says he was outside. So, like, we don't even know if she fell down the stairs. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's just like it's not about even what you know or what you can prove, because how could you prove any of it? I'll tell you what, whether she fell down the stairs uh, while facing backwards or down the stairs while go walking down them, either way, I don't think there's a world where, based on the photos that I've seen, the amount of blood that you have, the amount of contusions that you have, that she fell down three or four stairs. Regardless of whether she was walking up the stairs or down the stairs, if this was an accident, she was near the top landing when 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 she fell. There's, it would be, I think it would be physically impossible for her to have that many injuries from only falling down a stair or two. I, I I mean, again, not an expert, gotta qualify it, but I don't see how that would be possible. She'd basically be rolling around on the ground on basically one or two stairs to cause all those injuries. Yo, so I agree, right? But I also don't see how her getting hit repeatedly over the head with like a blow poke 
would have caused those injuries, you know, especially not the ones that were like, they, they weren't that they weren't deep enough. If you're like hitting someone over the head with something over and over again, you'd expect to see something deeper. You'd expect to see some underlying damage, which we've already gone over and, and there there isn't any there. So I don't see how either, like to me, the accidental fall and hitting her on the head with the blow poke, neither of those things explains what what those wounds were. Now, is there a world where maybe the the person did beat her to death, but they didn't use a blow poke? Like this blow poke thing we're going to talk about in a minute is so stupid. I can't believe they even came up with this. If If she was attacked and her death wasn't an accident, I think it's far more likely that somebody was hitting her head into the stairs, right? Uh, yep, absolutely. If we're playing devil's advocate, if I'm going to see a world where she was assaulted and those the injuries from that assault is what killed her, he's standing over her. They get in a fight in the kitchen. It kind of stumbles onto the stairs. She maybe loses her balance while falling on the stairs. She has some initial injuries where she's bleeding while being assaulted. And that's how her feet get bloody because she's stepping in her own blood. She goes down. He's bouncing her head off the stairs from the front. So you're getting some slight abrasions on the front because he's using the pressure to, you know, to to hit her head off the stairs, the back of her head off the stairs. She's laying on the stairs. So she's getting the contusions on her back from that. And yeah, at that point, if he could be strangling her, he could be hitting her. He could be slapping her, punching her, which is causing the slight abrasions yeah. uh, to, to the face while getting more significant injuries on the back. That is at this point equally plausible so yeah we're just we're going through it all uh, this is why netflix is covering this case because it's not a slam dunk either way you slice it so the depending on what you believe i think more so about michael peterson and the facts themselves is the way you're gonna go and remember they said there was that that in the, you know above her shoulder there was kind of like a, a pressure right point like maybe somebody put their foot on her and kind of like braced her body while they hit her head into the stairs like that's what i see and then as we know and we're going to talk a little bit more about that but there was a footprint found on the back of her leg like somebody stepped on the back of her leg with with blood on the bottom of their shoes so it doesn't seem like this is you know i'm hitting her with a blow poke it seems more like very you know fisticuffs sort of like this is just she's getting beat but once again did michael peterson have you know bloody knuckles did he have wounds on his hands no he didn't so if she was getting beat with his hands like you said maybe he was punching her you'd expect to see something like that so i do really think if we live in a world where we're believing that michael peterson killed her on those stairs it's because he was grabbing her head you know, by her hair and slamming her head into the stairs and using the stairs as his weapon. Yeah, I, I I do think you'd probably see a lot more hair around the area. You would see some injuries, even if it was some defensive wounds, some scratches to his arms, his face, things mm -hmm. like that, his chest, something where before uh, rendering her unconscious, you would see signs of a struggle. Yeah, but we are going to to get inside the brain because they, they did do a neuropathology report as well. Before we dive into that... Let's have another break. It is really scary going out onto the World Wide Web alone with no protection, and sometimes it doesn't end well. Between hackers and phishing attempts and people out there trying to get at your private information like bank accounts, photos, and more, you need help staying safe and private on the internet, and Surfshark VPN can do that for you because it does it for me. Surfshark VPN is a modern VPN designed with the user in mind. It's powered by robust security mechanisms, which will keep you and your private information safe while you're on the internet, which is pretty much all of the time. And, you know, you can also keep all of your loved ones safe, too, because the great thing about Surfshark VPN is you can install it on an unlimited number of devices. So you can put it on your phone, your laptop, your tablet, your computer, your PS5, or your kids' PS5s, Xbox, their phones, their tablets, their computers. It goes on and on. It is truly 
unlimited. But Surfshark's also designed to be simple and intuitive so that you can enjoy the internet and not be stressed out and anxious all the time that someone is around the next corner ready to snatch your credit card information. Also, did you know that with Surfshark, you can unlock 15 of the largest Netflix country libraries, including the US and Japan, but it's not only Netflix, you can also access BBC iPlayer, Hulu, and other limited streaming services wherever you are by connecting to VPN servers in the countries where they're available. And Surfshark has now reached coverage in 100 countries. They're the only VPN to do that at this time. And there's apps for all platforms, including PC, Mac, Android, iOS, smart TVs, Amazon, Fire Stick, Apple TV, Chrome, Firefox, Xbox, and PlayStation. And like I said, I cannot stress enough, security like Surfshark on these gaming systems and on these gaming consoles, especially if you have kids, is really invaluable. Also, Surfshark has 24-7 live customer support. There's nothing worse than your tech not working when you need it to. So Surfshark ensures that your issues will be solved quickly so you can get back to your life. And they have a strict no-logs policy, which I definitely love and appreciate because that means they'll never keep your data ever. And if you aren't 100% sure that Surfshark VPN makes your internet experience safer and better, they offer a 30-day money-back guarantee so you have plenty of time to try it out risk-free. And Derek's going to tell you how he's got a great deal for you. That's right. For a limited time, get 83% off a two-year plan plus three extra months for free at surfshark.deals slash crime weekly. This special offer makes your subscription just $2.21 per month. Once again, go to surfshark.deals slash crime weekly and use our code crime weekly to protect your online privacy today. So we're back. And uh, because it was clear that Kathleen Peterson had had a trauma, the medical examiner wanted to look deeper into the brain. So in a situation like this, the brain and the dura would be removed from the skull and placed in a chemical that basically freezes it, halting decomposition and causing the brain tissue to become fixed. And this usually takes some time, like they gotta put it in the substance until the brain tissue does become fixed. And so by early February of 2012, this had happened, and neuropathologist Thomas Bolden was able to give his opinion, which was, quote, the cause of death in this case was due to severe concussive injury of the brain caused by multiple blunt force impacts of the head. Blood loss from the deep scalp lacerations may have also played a role in her death. The number, severity, locations, and orientation of these injuries are inconsistent with a fall downstairs. Instead, they are indicative of multiple impacts received as a result of beating, end quote. And this decision mainly came from the presence of something called red neurons. Sections of Kathleen's cerebellum and cerebrum showed the presence of these rare red neurons, um, and, and this was basically consistent with Kathleen having a significant episode of widespread brain ischemia at least a few hours prior to her death. So brain ischemia is the result of restricted blood flow, and with no oxygen-rich blood being delivered to parts of the brain over extended periods of time, you basically see death and necrosis in those areas of the brain that were blood deprived. Now the red neurons are what suggests to the neuropathologist that there was decreased blood flow to these areas of the brain. The red neurons are basically born when brain cells die. So Dr. Thomas Bolden would later testify that the presence of these red neurons was proof that Kathleen had experienced decreased blood flow to her brain for approximately two hours before her death. And this would have been proof that she'd been dead for two hours before Michael Peterson made the 911 call. It would be proof that he could not have seen her an hour before he claims he found her on the floor in a puddle of her own blood. The presence of red neurons, the widespread nature of the early acute ischemic necrosis, that suggests that Kathleen died slowly. And unless she was passed out or unconscious, her death was most likely very painful. Well, that's interesting because we're not going to dispute the doctor, the brain, you know, the person who's an expert in brains. And these words are way smarter than I am as far as what it means and neurons and all that. So you just got to kind of go with them. He's saying, in layman's terms, there's no way this was due to a flight of stairs, right? Falling down a flight of stairs. He's saying that she was assaulted, right? That's the takeaway? Yeah, yeah basically, yeah. And the only thing I was a little confused on is then at the end there, it says, oh, she could have died slowly over a period of two hours. Well, to me, 
again, the not smart guy, that would be suggestive of a fall down the stairs and maybe not being attended to immediately where we don't have to go back to the duration because we talked about that with Michael and whether it's right or wrong and the discrepancies within that. But let's say she falls down the flight of stairs and she's there for a while and her injuries weren't immediately life-threatening, like she was obviously bleeding out. But there's a lot of injuries out there where if you're not attended to for an extended period of time, you will bleed out and you could die. So that last part, although I guess it's supposed to support the theory that she was assaulted, to me would be more suggestive that whatever occurred to her, if it were a person doing it, they would have made sure she was dead, where it sounds like the injuries occurred and then she kind of just sat there or laid there for a while and just died due to her injuries over a period of time where I can't see Michael allowing that to happen. What if she doesn't die if that's what he's trying to uh, make occur? Right. Dude, I'm on the same page. It's like, this is what I'm saying. They say things and they're like, this is proof of this, which means it's proof of this. And I'm like, are we just dumb? Are, do we just misunderstanding it? Are we dumb? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Can we just because... prove that we're dumb? Or or they're trying to make us feel dumb because as far as I'm concerned, like, yeah, we already talked kind of about like, you know, Michael's outside by the pool, allegedly. He they've been drinking, he's like smoking his pipe. He could have dozed off and just yeah. thought that he was out there for an hour and he was out there for like two hours. And then he goes inside and, and he's all disoriented. He doesn't know exactly what time it is. And and I think that the presence of these red neurons, which would mean she died a slow, painful death, are, are more supportive of a fall down the stairs where nobody's there to like help her. Because like, listen, yes, do husbands kill their wives? Yes. Do they kill them for several different motives like money, jealousy, um, whatever? Yes. But do I think it's plausible that any person who had ever loved somebody and had lived with them for that long could literally let somebody lay there like breathing, like like still breathing, but dying a slow, painful death while they walk around and like set the stage and put wine glasses out. You know, like he would have to know she was still alive because she would have been gurgling and bleeding and still breathing and things. So am I, are we supposed to believe that he like hit her, didn't know she was still alive and he's just walking around while she's slowly dying there? I think I think that is what they're trying to suggest. I'm not saying that I agree, but that it, it does sound like he injured her. They're trying to say he injured her. The injury sustained couldn't have been caused by a fall to the stairs. So he injures her. He believes maybe she's already dead, but she's not. And she's laying there and she's maybe un, you know unconscious or whatever, but she's still alive, barely. And while he's setting the stage, which explains why it took so long for him to call police because he was there right away. Um, yeah. While he's setting the stage and cleaning up after himself, not knowing she's still alive slightly, that's that's why you have these results. I think that's what they're trying to say. So I get it. It just to me on the surface, when you read it, it sounds more in line with the other theory as far as her being her being injured and not being attended to. Yeah, but dude, check it out because their theory is also because they got to explain why is there dried blood and then fresh or fresher blood over the dried blood. OK, now their theory with that is like the initial injuries caused the the first blood that dried and then possibly when he figured out she wasn't dead he started beating on oh, her man. again which is where the fresh blood came from like mingya i mean like yeah anybody who kills their wife for money or whatever is a bad person but that's a monster like that's an actual monster who would do that and honestly like i just don't see why somebody would do that to somebody they knew maybe like if you're a psychopath or like a ted bundy serial killer and and it's a stranger maybe but like somebody you knew loved lived with i just have a hard time understanding how that could happen and and that's also another thing they sort of like have all these random theories about what happened and why he did it because they have two different motives that they kind of go with and then they have all these random theories of how it happened and then they just sort of like make the evidence fit those random theories like oh she died a slow painful death but why was there you know blood that was dried and then fresh blood over that well now we have to explain that because this is probably what happened you know and it just kind of doesn't make a lot of sense with with who we know Michael to be, like maybe not the most honest guy, maybe not the most straightforward guy, but is he a violent monster who would beat his wife to death like twice? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, 
it would be foolish of me to be like, oh, no, that's not possible because we've seen we we're just covering on Crime Weekly News. We we're just covering the Idaho murders. And you think about that. We talked a little bit about motive and saying, you know, there's no way, regardless of whether we knew the motive or not, it would it would satisfy whatever we need because it wouldn't ration, it wouldn't be rational to most normal people. I guess I'll say this. Ultimately, there's three different scenarios here we're looking at. It's one where it was this premeditated murder, maybe based on financial motive, right? Money, insurance, all that stuff. Or it was a, an argument that ensued after she found out things about him that she was unaware of. And that argument escalated to a, an assault, which escalated to this death. Or it was an accident. I think two of those three scenarios, which is the fight that gets more violent and leads to a death, and the accident are more plausible than the premeditation. It doesn't seem like there were any signs of dissension or some type of misunderstanding between the family. They were drinking wine, hanging out. There doesn't seem like there was any evidence to, uh, that put forward a, a plot to kill her prior to that on his laptop, any other place. So I think we're looking at the, the two other scenarios being more plausible. And if that's the case, like you just said, if he assaulted her and it, it escalates to a point where he's going to kill her, he's going to make sure she's dead. I would also say just to combat the idea that she, the first blood, the dried blood is from the initial assault and the fresh blood is from him going back and realizing she's not dead and having to continue doing what he was doing. I would also make the argument that that could be a situation where she falls down the stairs. There's all this blood from the initial injury. It starts to dry up. He comes in. Now he's in the crime scene with her and he's moving her around. He's got the, her blood on him. He's touching walls. He's moving her body a little bit. And now blood from her body or is getting on him. And now he's touching things. And now there's fresh blood over the blood that's been drying for almost two hours. So that could also explain it and still be an accident. And so again, I'm, I'm, I'm torn. You can go either way with it, depending on, I guess it, it goes back to what you were just saying. Again, it goes back to Michael. And when you look at him, what do you think he's capable of? Okay, I agree. Like, it's tough to say that this was premeditated murder. But understand, the prosecution charged him with first-degree murder. Mm -hmm. No lesser charges. Meaning, they believed yeah. it was premeditated. And yeah. when Dwayne Deaver, their blood spatter expert, when he talked about the blood spatter, he talked about it in a way as if it was a foregone conclusion that this was premeditated. But then you have to look at their motives, right? They got two motives that they sort of go back and forth with during the whole trial, depending on what's convenient for them, depending on what they're talking about. Either A, it was the money, he was killing her for the money, which would suggest premeditation, or B, <laughs> B, it's the pictures that she sees on his computer and then they have a fight and then she dies because he attacks her, which is not premeditated, which I think we can both agree that her finding those pictures and then like saying, oh, what is this? And then him being like, ah, and like attacking her, not premeditated, yet they brought that up and used that as a theory for his motive and still charged him with first degree murder. So it just doesn't seem like they even knew, they were literally just throwing things at the wall. And usually you see that with the defense team, not the prosecution, you really want the state to kind of have a handle on what the hell they think happened before they go into this trial and start throwing things around like like a wild person. Yeah, this one's, this one's a head scratcher. I'll say that it's a head scratcher. I've never, honestly, I've never seen such a like ass backwards prosecution team than this one. And oh, I have. I hope you have. Go, go watch the OJ Simpson trial. Well, I mean, <laughs> let's have him try on a glove when he has been That's off his defense. arthritic medication for two weeks. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's a smart one. <laughs> Well, but but I mean, like that that is another like obviously we think OJ did it right, and so the uh, prosecution yeah. did too, right? Mm. So, but you sometimes believe something so heartily that you think you're you're invincible. You believe it so heartily that you're like, there's no way this glove ain't gonna fit. So what's the what's the harm in doing this? Because we think we're invincible. We're just gonna fly mm. through like Superman here, and nothing can touch us. We're bulletproof, and then you shoot yourself in the foot because you're not bulletproof. Mm -hmm. So Michael's defense team used forensic neuropathologist Dr. Jan Listma to contradict the opinion of the medical examiner and the neuropathologist who had performed Kathleen's autopsy. I do want to say that I read the neuropathologist who did um, Kathleen's autopsy was not board certified, 
whereas Dr. Jan Liestma was. I read that. I don't know if it's true, but I'm just going to put it out there. Dr. Liestma had worked as the chief of neurology at Northwestern University's Medical Center. He was an associate medical examiner and neuropathology consultant, and he had examined over 5,000 brains and had reportedly consulted on hundreds of cases of beating deaths. And he disagreed with the results of the autopsy and with the prosecution's claim that Kathleen had been beaten to death with a fireplace blowpoke. Now, remember, (laughs) at this time, the prosecution did not have the actual murder weapon, but they did bring in a similar blowpoke so that the jury could see it and feel it. And they kept like waving it around and they were always walking around the courtroom with it. And. You know, it it really looks like the whole idea of the blowpoke being the murder weapon originated with Kathleen's sister, Candace Zamperini. And Candace testified that she'd given Kathleen this fireplace blowpoke for Christmas of 1984. So when Kathleen was still married to her ex-husband, Fred Atwater, her sister gifted her this this blowpoke. And, you know, she said, I gave it to her in 1984, like she always had it. And she showed the police pictures from 1987, 1996, 1999, where the same blowpoke was seen in Kathleen's house when she was with Fred and then when she was with Michael. But when the police searched the Peterson home after Kathleen's death, allegedly, (laughs) they couldn't find it anywhere. However, when David Rudolph showed Candace pictures of the Peterson fireplace in 2000, there was no blowpoke in the pictures. And Candace was like, yeah, well, I mean, like, I don't know if it was there in 2000. I hadn't been to my sister's house since 1999. The prosecution was actually able to get their hands on this replica blowpoke, which was exactly the same as the one that Candace had given Kathleen, because apparently Candace, Candace Zamperini had a thing for blowpokes and she gifted them to like everyone. So um, they were able to to get another one of these blowpokes and use it to show the jury what kind of weapon could have been used to cause Kathleen's death. And the reason the prosecution seems to have placed all their eggs into the blowpoke basket is because of the fact that Kathleen had these lacerations on her head, but those lacerations weren't deep enough to cause skull fractures or brain damage. And the the blowpoke is, it's long and it's thin. So they believed that they could have caused those lacerations, but it's hollow, right? Because apparently a blowpoke can be used believe it or not, to blow or poke. You know what I mean? Like for a fireplace, you can Mm. blow through it because it's hollow. So you can like stoke the fire that way or you can like poke at the logs. Also, it does both, which is kind of crazy because I'd never heard of a blow poke before in my life. But apparently it's like this long, thin, hollow tube that also is like a pokey thing on the end. And that's what they thought had made these lacerations because they're figuring like, Okay, it's like strong enough to to break skin, but not strong enough to break, you know, bone. Mm. I want everyone to take a drink if you're over the age of 21 every time Stephanie says poke tonight. Or blow. Hey, now, see, I wasn't going to go there. See how I stuck just a po- Okay, never mind. Head in the gutter. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm going to say blow and poke a lot more, so grab your drink. That's what I'm saying. I know it's coming. I can see it in the script, yeah. so... So Dr. Jan Liestma, he was basically on a roll and he pointed out this blowpoke could not have been the weapon responsible for the wounds on Kathleen's skull because every weapon leaves its own distinctive marks. And the blowpoke, which was round and a half inch in diameter, would have split her scalp in a straight line only where it contacted her head. And that split would have been in a V or Y shaped pattern where the round skull curves away from the straight blowpoke's impact point. Kathleen's wounds, Dr. Liestma testified, radiated in several directions from likely impact points, more like the way ice cracks when something is dropped on it. He said that Kathleen's wounds were more likely to have come from hitting her head against a flat, immovable object, like stairs. Dr. Liestma said, quote, These are not linear type lacerations in the scalp. These are complex and, if anything, look more like splitting injuries, end quote. Which I agree with, by the way, because like I said, I hit my head on a kitchen kitchen counter. 
And the same thing happened. It looked like it looked like I had cut myself with a knife when I finally looked at it in the bathroom mirror and I got all the blood off. It looked as if somebody had taken a knife and like split my skin, but everything underneath was fine. It was just bleeding a lot. I had to get stitches. And then I looked really rough for like a couple of weeks. In fact, I got sent home from work. They were like, you can't serve tables looking like this. You look like Frankenstein. That's what they said to me. But I agree. When you look at the the wounds on Kathleen's head, and some of these are tri-pronged. So it almost looks like Dr. Lisma explained, like when you drop something, like if you dropped a bowling ball on on some thick ice, it would kind of have these like fractures or like, you know, kind of arms that come off the impact point. And I do think that they that the wounds on her head, from what I could see as far as the drawings, did look like that. Dr. Listema also said that in his experience, the vast majority of deadly beatings to the head resulted in skull fractures and damage to the brain underneath, and neither of these were present in Kathleen. Dr. Listema also disagreed with the medical examiner, Dr. Deborah Radish, who had already testified that there were defensive wounds on Kathleen's hands and arms. Dr. Listema said that Kathleen had no broken bones in her hands or wrists, which you would expect to see if she was defending herself against a swinging metal rod. According to Dr. Listema, Kathleen had fallen and hit her head, causing wounds that bled heavily. And when she tried to stand up, she slipped on her own blood, falling again and hitting her head again, causing a total of four or five impact sites. When Dr. Jan Listema was cross-examined by District Attorney Jim Hardin, he was confronted with his own words from a 1987 textbook that he had written. And in this book, Dr. Listema had claimed that a contra-coup injury is one of the telltale signs of a fall that affects the back of the head. And basically, and I didn't have to look this up because I remembered it from a different case, the Lindsay Parton case, uh, it, may, it basically means that you would see bruising on the brain that's caused when the brain is, moves back and forth inside of the skull. Uh, so if you were, you know, shooken or, you know, you fell and hit your head very hard, your brain would sort of like go and fly forwards towards the front of your skull and you'd see bruising um, on corresponding areas of the brain. And there was no coup or contra coup injury on Kathleen's brain. So basically, the district attorney, Jim Harden, was like, how can you say so confidently that you that she had fallen down the stairs when she doesn't have coup or contra coup injuries on her brain? And uh, Dr. Jan Listma, when asked about the red neurons that the neuropathologist had seen, he even claimed that they indicated that Kathleen had suffered severe blood loss at least 30 to 45 minutes before she died. But he did say that it didn't take two hours for those red neurons to pop up. They could come uh, and be seen in the brain within 30 to 45 minutes, which once again would support Michael Peterson's claims that he'd been outside and he came in when Kathleen had already fallen and there was already quite a lot of blood. And it was Dr. Listma who claimed that the injury to Kathleen's thyroid cartilage would be consistent with a post-mortem injury similar to artifactual bleeding when the spine is removed during autopsy. Dr. Listma also talked to the jury about 257 autopsy reports from people who had died in North Carolina from blunt force trauma to the head as a result of a beating. Of the 257, Dr. Listma informed the jury that 215 autopsies showed skull, facial, or other associated fractures, and of the remaining cases, only eight of them did not have traumatic brain injury. So basically, out of the 257 autopsy reports where people had died after being beaten, only eight of them did not have traumatic brain injury or skull, facial, or other associated fractures. So if Kathleen was in the same boat and she had been beaten to death, she'd be in the the drastic minority of cases where she wouldn't be exhibiting any of these things. Pretty compelling, right? Yeah. Pretty compelling. I think so. And that's deferring to the to the experts. If you're to believe them in this case and you you're you're believing they're coming from a place of truthfulness where they're not just trying to skate it one way or the other, that's obviously always a lens you have to con- look through and consider. But that statistic that they're putting out, I'm sure was confirmed and vetted and and more than likely accurate. So that that all being the case, it doesn't mean it's not a hundred percent, right? There are cases where you do have situations where people are assaulted and you don't have those signs. So she could fall into that category. 
Uh, but more likely than not, it wouldn't be the case. And then you have these weird circumstances surrounding this particular case where we don't even know if it was an assault. In some of those cases, I'm sure they definitively knew based on whatever evidence they had, this person was assaulted and yet they didn't have these signs. All of this, those cases, they definitively knew that that it was a beating death. Yeah, They knew it was a beating and you still didn't have it. And this one, we're not even saying that. We don't know. We, mm -hmm. we truly don't know. So to have that here is is interesting but then again you go back to what you were saying earlier about the neurons and things like that and it's it's a seesaw you go back and forth throughout this whole this whole story where there's there's moments where i'm like ah eh, not looking good for michael and then it, like 15 minutes later you know we get into the 911 call or whatever and i'm like eh, we disagreed there but there, i'm back and forth on it and i and i feel like what's interesting to me knowing what happens as the uh, near the end as far as the alfred plea and stuff I don't know why he felt like he needed to take that in this case. Maybe he just was really scared of potentially what could happen. But man, this is a so far to me a weak case. I agree. It is a weak case. And in fact, I'm stunned going deeper into it that the jury came to the conclusion that they did. And, you know, we will find that they did come to this conclusion based heavily off of Dwayne Deaver's testimony, which right. turned out to be bullshit so <laughs> um you know to put it to put it kindly and and once again i will say like when you're looking at these these statistics only eight of them to not have these things like kathleen and when you look at the red neurons it's not as if red neurons only occur when somebody's beaten to death they can occur anytime there's head trauma or trauma that prevents blood from getting to certain areas of the brain car accidents um falls things like that you will see those red neurons they are not a sign that somebody has definitively been beaten it just happens when the blood can't reach the brain tissue and the brain tissue dies and then those red neurons are born out of that brain tissue dying but here if you look at dr jan listra's uh listma's um, statistics, yeah, that is very compelling. So let's take a quick break and we'll be right back. At the start of the new year, we always have the best intentions. I know that personally, I've already promised myself that this is going to be the year I focus more on me, try to take better care of my physical and mental health by being more physically active on the day to day and spending less time on my phone. But we all can use a little help to reach our goals. And when it comes to taking care of myself, I know I can depend on Daily Harvest to make that job easier. Daily Harvest delivers delicious harvest bowls, soups, flatbread snacks, smoothies, lattes, and more all built on organic fruits and vegetables. I personally will always love Daily Harvest smoothies. Like I love all of the stuff that they have. I like their harvest bowls a lot too. Um, I like their soups a lot, but the smoothies are just always going to be OG for me because I have a bad habit of not eating during the day when I'm working and being able to just throw a Daily Harvest smoothie in the blender and have something that's not only good for me but delicious in just a few minutes is truly priceless. Daily Harvest works directly with farmers to source the best ingredients. Those ingredients are then frozen at peak freshness to lock in the flavors and nutrients, and they never use artificial preservatives or ingredients. With nourishing, easy-to-prep options like their smoothies, I never have to think twice about what to eat for my next meal, snack, or or even dessert because Daily Harvest has some amazing ice cream too. Everything stays fresh in my freezer until I'm ready to enjoy, not only making my life easier and healthier, but also reducing food waste. And Daily Harvest is really committed to human and planetary health, which means they do their absolute best to ensure transparency and integrity when it comes to their ingredients and the humans who grow them. By supporting farmers who invest in practices that increase biodiversity and improve the health of our soil, and by delivering food in recyclable and compostable packaging whenever possible, Daily Harvest does the work. All you have to do is eat and enjoy. We love Daily Harvest a lot. Derek's going to tell you how you can try Daily Harvest out for yourself. If eating well is a goal for 2023, let Daily Harvest support you on the journey. Go to dailyharvest.com slash crimeweekly to get up to $40 off your first box. That's dailyharvest.com slash crime weekly for up to $40 off your first box. One more time, dailyharvest.com slash crime weekly. Okay, we're back and now we're going to talk about <laughs> the blood spatter analysis that was performed by Special Agent Dwayne Deaver, who arrived at the Peterson home approximately 14 hours after Kathleen's death was reported. Now, Deaver claimed, based on what he saw at the scene and from what he saw of articles of clothing worn by Michael Peterson, 
that he didn't think Kathleen could have possibly died from a fall down the stairs. He believed she'd been attacked and her husband had been the one to do the attacking. The articles of clothing that Dwayne Deaver examined were a pair of Brooks Sport brand shorts that Michael had been wearing the night his wife died. Now, the front of those shorts were heavily bloodstained to the point where blood had soaked through to the inside fabric of the pockets. And there was a V pattern um, on the front of the shorts, like kind of in the crotch area. And Dwayne said that it looked like this blood had been, you know, basically tried to be washed up on the shorts. Like Michael had gotten the blood all over his shorts and then he took water and like kind of scrubbed it in that V area to like clean the shorts. Dwayne Deaver said he would have expected to have seen some smears and contact blood stains on Michael's shorts from when he'd been embracing Kathleen, but Deaver said he also noted blood spatters, including blood spatter on the inside of the right leg of Michael's shorts. To Dwayne Deaver, the blood spatter inside the right leg of the shorts was something that he had seen in relation to many crime scenes, but not crime scenes depicting accidental deaths. The blood being on the inside of the shorts told Dwayne Deaver that Michael Peterson had been standing over Kathleen, hitting her, causing the blood to spatter upwards towards him. The evidence team had also collected four white athletic socks, which had been found at the bottom of the staircase, along with a pair of white men's Converse athletic shoes, size eight and a half. These were Michael's shoes. The soles of both shoes were bloodstained and both shoes had blood spatters, drips, smears, and contact stains. On the right shoe, Dwayne Deaver noted 90-degree drops of blood on the toe, indicating that Michael had been wearing the shoes at the time of Kathleen's death. His foot would have been directly underneath the dripping blood. Deaver believed that Michael had been wearing the shoes because he saw small droplets of blood on the outside edge of the shoe, and he said that these blood drops had noticeable directionality, meaning the foot had been in motion when the blood had fallen on it. The white size medium L.L. Bean sweatpants Kathleen Peterson had been wearing also showed heavy blood stains, specifically on the front waist area, and Deaver once again noticed that there were diluted blood stains visible along the crotch of the pants and down each side of the leg. Now, what stood out the most about the pants Kathleen had been wearing when she died was the transfer stain in blood found on the back of her right leg, a shoe track in blood that matched Michael Peterson's size eight and a half Converse sneakers. And I will admit, like, if that's true, which can we can we believe anything Dwayne Deaver says as being true? I don't even know anymore. But if that's true, it is suspicious because why is Michael stepping on the back of Kathleen's leg? after he stepped in in her blood you know like why is that happening yeah and for me my understanding going through this and maybe i just missed it was that he was barefoot during this whole occurrence he had been out by the pool bare feet and then came in but you're nodding your head no so maybe i'm just wrong no he i don't think he i don't think he was barefoot by the pool he was barefoot when first responders got there but then his shoes and socks were found in in the blood so it looks like (laughs) he took them off yeah Okay. The print on her is definitely questionable and something that's suspicious. The fact that the shoes were found so close and the socks were found so close to where whatever happened occurred, it does weaken its its strength a little bit to me. Now, if those Converse shoes or socks and or socks, doesn't even matter if it was both, were found somewhere else in the in the house, mm-hmm. uh, at where nowhere near where they could have gotten blood spatter on them during whatever occurred, then it would be a lot stronger to me, but it doesn't, I'm not discrediting them at all. It's definitely valuable evidence that we have to interpret and kind of try to understand what the blood blood spatter on them means. And again, we have another expert here and you don't really like this guy from what I can tell. I don't know where we're going with it, but. um, Oh man, because if Michael Peterson is guilty, Dwayne Deaver screwed everything up by literally pulling stuff out of his ass is what happened here. So like, yeah, I don't like him. (laughs) I can tell. So I think what he was trying to say was like, okay, Michael comes in with his shoes on. You know, he's got his shoes on. He beats Kathleen to death while he's wearing the shoes, causing her blood to drip onto his shoes. 
He steps on her while he continues to beat her, even though he's already got blood on his shoe, which leaves the blood on her pants. And then he's like, oh, shit, I got blood all over my shoes. Let me take them off and leave them in this pile of blood and then creep around the house barefoot and set up the scene to make it look like we were drinking and having a great night and I was out by the pool. That's what Dwayne Deaver is basically saying happened here. Yeah, I mean, it's. It's possible. I know I keep saying that, but yeah, who am I to say, oh, he's completely wrong. There's no way, shape or form that could have happened. It just seems awful sloppy, right? Because that, if that's the case, then you would assume there was some premeditation and it seems like it wasn't well thought out. But I guess you could make the argument that if this was a crime that escalated over time and it wasn't expected after the fact when Michael realized what he had done, that's when he's trying to go back and clean up his mess in hindsight so that he doesn't have law enforcement looking at him which clearly didn't work but i would have think i would think that whether it was accidental or or intentional i don't know why you're taking your shoes and socks off i don't i don't think that's something i would have been thinking about that's more questionable to me than what some of the evidence we've discussed like the the idea that he cleaned up some of the blood and decided oh let me get the let me get my wife's blood off my let me get these shoes these bloody shoes and socks off before law enforcement gets here because if we're to believe that he found her when he found her and he calls police it's not long after where first responders arrive and he's already taken off his socks and sneakers like what when did you have a moment to do that while your wife your who's dying or has just died uh, is laying there. I don't know if that would be something that would be on my mind. Well, they're saying that it, it, he didn't call the police right when he found her, that he beat her to death, right. then staged the yes. scene, then called, right? And that, that, to me, that behavior of taking off the shoes and socks would be more in line with something like that than an accident where you just found your wife, she's deceased, and you're thinking about anything other than her. I think it's weird. Yeah. I think it's weird that he took off his socks and shoes. I completely agree. But what I don't understand is how can you charge him with first degree premeditated murder, but then act like he basically killed her and then said, oh, shit, I've got to stage this so it doesn't look like I killed her. That doesn't say that to me. Saying like, oh, after I have her blood all over me, I have to stage this scene says it was, you know, a a crime of passion. Yeah. Right. And now I'm having to clean up my own mess and not something that was premeditated. It just doesn't make sense. Their, Their theories, their argument, the way they decided to charge him. And what they claim his motives were, none of that makes sense together. I agree with that. I agree with that. There's kind of two different theories going on into one story. And some of the stuff they put forward contradicts some of the stuff they've said earlier in the episode. Which I understand because they they looked at this and they said, we 100% believe he did this, which I'm on board. Okay, I get it. But now what you did with the the prosecution's case was completely just mishmash everything together so that when... You know, something does come out like Dwayne Deaver's past history with other cases. Now the whole thing falls apart because it never had a strong foundation to begin with. And now you could have somebody who should be in prison for the rest of his life for what he did walking free because you guys didn't have your shit together. Wouldn't be the first time. They wouldn't. So going into how Dwayne Deaver inspected the crime scene, I was initially going to tell you guys where every drop of blood was located. That was when I had faith in him and what he was doing. But as I went through this and as I kind of looked at what what was actually happening here and really, honestly, blood spatter is not a perfect science. It's not a perfect science when when you're even talking about somebody like Dr. Henry Lee, who I believe it was just, what was it, like 2018 or 2019 that he was being accused of, you know, putting a bunch of innocent people in prison because of his blood spatter analysis and things like that. What we have to realize is whether you're Dwayne Deaver and you've been doing this for two years or you're Dr. Henry Lee and you've been doing it for 50 years, it's not a perfect science either way. And, you know, the jury does put a lot of stock into this stuff because for them, it's something they can see. It's a map that can be drawn for them. And I do think that Dwayne Deaver took advantage of that. So I was going to first tell you where every drop of blood was located, but I'm not going to do that now because honestly, we're going to come to find that it pretty much all gets thrown out anyways. But Dwayne Deaver first inspected the crime scene at around 5 p.m. on December 9th, 2001. And he initially concluded that the blood patterns near the stairs indicated that Kathleen had died from at least four blows. Three of the blows created blood spatter near the bottom of the stairs where Kathleen had been found. And he believed a fourth blow was the initial injury that caused the bleeding. 
After further testing and examination of blood and items found at the scene, Deaver concluded that two of the blows were made at least 19 to 11 inches above the second to bottom stair. The third spatter indicated to him that there was also a blow 27 inches above the fourth stair from the bottom. Additionally, Deaver would later testify that blood found on the header of a hallway wall at the bottom of the stairs could be cast off from a blow that was delivered while someone stood on the second to last stair. Like I said, I'm not going to go over all of these specific blood stain patterns, but what I want to let you know is he did number these stairs starting 1 through 18. 1 would be the top stair and then the bottom stair would be 18. Uh, We also have blood spatters on the wall outside of the staircase as well as on the header over the hall leading to the kitchen area. So if you're looking at this picture, which I'll send Shannon so she can put it in, there's the little like stairway and it kind of goes out into a hall and then there's a door where that hall leads into the kitchen. There was blood spatter on the walls of the hall and on the top of, of the door basically that leads to the kitchen. There was just two drops of blood there, but that's 114 inches off the floor. So that's like over nine feet. Now, Deaver claimed that these drops showed a downward path of origin from above the drops. So he said that this was cast off from a weapon that was swinging upwards. At the front of the stairwell, Deaver also saw a pair of footprints in the blood transfer. And he said that this would have been the same spot Kathleen's body had been found. So he believed that Kathleen, who we know had blood on the bottom of both her bare feet, had at one point stood up in her own blood. And that's why there was footprints there, and that's why she had blood on the bottom of her feet. The trim molding on the stairs did have finger and hair-like transfer stains as well as blood stains, and the light switch to the left of the trim molding had a blood transfer stain on it. There was a piece of trim along the inside stairwell above step number 15, which remember is still one of those lower steps, that had finger-like blood transfer stains as well, And there was three individual stains at the end of the handrail, which made it look as if someone had tried to pull themselves up. That handrail end would be towards the bottom of the stairs as well. So the cast off is the big takeaway there. If it it is cast off, obviously suggestive of an assault. Um, And I'm trying to, as you're reading it, play it out through my head. Okay, you have droplets on the wall. Definitely could be cast off. But is there another way to explain it where it could be still an accident? And I'm thinking in my head here, I don't know if it was ever brought up, but if Michael walks in and he he grabs her initially, he's got her blood on him and he's kind of flailing around, taking off his shoes, <laughs> taking off his socks, he could have some droplets spray onto the wall. It may also explain the one uh, spot of blood that you had mentioned that I thought was interesting, uh, the light switch, to have blood on the light switch itself. Did he walk in and the light was off and he said, oh my God, and he flicked the light on quick after again after touching her. Because I don't think during the assault you would have that that you know the, the someone turned the light switch on whether it was Catherine or Michael. I would be interested to know if the blood on the light switch was blood spatter where it was like spray, or was it someone flipping on the switch? You know, so it looks like you're shaking your head. No, so probably blood spatter. It was blood transfer. So that is somebody touching the switch, as far there as I'm go. concerned. So yeah. so that that's not blood spatter. So that is someone consciously turning on a light after an injury. And so you have clearly at that point, Kathleen's bleeding and either she or Michael flipped a switch on. Uh, I don't know why that would happen. If it was during an assault, I could see it more happening. If you discovered Kathleen and didn't expect to find her like that and you turn Mm -hmm. on a light, you grab her quick, like Kathleen, you shake her. She doesn't move. Oh my God. You flip on the light to kind of try to see what's going on. I don't know if I can see a world where he's flipping on the light switch after he kills her, but I guess the people out there would say you could argue he's staging it. He's setting it up. He's making it look like, okay, she was in the house. She was fine. She flipped on the switch to go up the stairs. She slips and falls and accidentally hurts herself. And then poor Michael comes in to find her later. So he's, he might be staging it to look like it's just a a normal day where he could have killed her. And now he's got his blood all over her himself. And now as he's staging it, he's this blood transfer occurring in multiple areas, including the light switch. So again, you, whichever way you want to look at it, you can take this information and mold it to fit your narrative. But this is purely an opinion by this guy. And, and I get where he's coming from as far as some of the blood spatter. But 
I feel like the most interesting thing that I can't explain is the fact that there's a, I just want to make sure I got this right, a bloody potential shoe print on the back of her leg, mm-hmm. right? That's a mm-hmm. problem. Why Why? Would, why are you stepping on your wife? What, what's going on there? Maybe you tripped over her. Could that be it? Like you're as you're moving around, you slip and step on her accidentally. I mean, it seems like an awful yeah. lot of accidents. Yeah, but man, could you imagine if it really did go down like that and this guy's like getting accused of murder and he's like, I just walked in. There was wa- something wet on the floor. I didn't realize what it was. So I walked over to turn on the light switch in the process, getting blood on the bottom of my feet, stepping on her and turning the light switch on. Or you could say the light switch was turned on by Kathleen, who both the prosecution and the defense claim she stood up in her own blood because they got to explain why she has blood on the bottom of her feet. Right. You have mm. to explain that somehow. So she falls, hits her head, starts bleeding. And as she's injured, she's trying to stand up because she doesn't realize what's going on. And then she slips in her own blood again. So maybe as she's standing up, pulling on the handrail, pulling herself up, she goes to flip the light switch. And that's where that blood comes from. We don't know. But what I will say is only two drops of cast off on the header because there's just two drops up there. There's none on the ceiling. Okay, there's there's if you're getting hit that many times, you'd expect there to probably be more than two drops of cast off, right? Yeah, usually if if, if she's bleeding the entire time, it depends on what injuries cause caused her to bleed. But if you have six blood spatter patterns, you would expect to see seven blows because obviously the first blow, there's no cast off. The cast off occurs after the victim is bleeding. So as you're assaulting that person, their blood is now on the instrument or your hand. And as you're bringing it back, you're casting off the blood onto the wall or onto whatever object you're talking about. So, yeah, you would expect to see more, especially with the amount of blood that you have in that area. Right. If it's a if it's a if it's this bloody crime scene where she's being murdered with his fist or with a with a weapon, I think you would see more blood on the wall or you would have some type of luminol test done later and find just blood everywhere that's been cleaned. Now, listen, there's no cast off from this blow poke that they literally talked about every single day. No cast off from this blow poke. And when Dwayne Deavers asked about this on the stand, do you know what he said? No, but you're going to tell me. Yeah. He said, uh, well, if uh, Michael Peterson wiped the blow poke off on his shirt every time he went back to hit her, like after every blow, then you wouldn't see cast off. Mm. So it's what a... does that make any sense? That's ridiculous. Yeah, I'm not buying it. Who's literally like beating somebody to death with a blow poke and like, hold on, this blow poke is messy. Let me wipe it off on my shirt before I go back for another another hit. Like, mm. that's ridiculous because that's going to assume that like Michael Peterson knows there's going to be cast off. So he has to prevent that. And Dwayne Deaver was saying this because he's like, well, it's premeditated. He knew it would there would be cast off. So he's like making sure that the crime scene doesn't, you know, look like a murder. But you guys said it looked like a murder as soon as you walked in. So, like, you're contradicting yourselves again. Yeah, I'm definitely leaning more towards if this was an assault, it wasn't premeditated because he did a really shitty job, if that Mm -hmm. were the case. So if you're going to say on one hand he was conscious enough to wipe the weapon off between each blow, but yet there's a million, there's like four or five different things in this crime scene that implicates him as potentially being a murderer, to have that type of self-awareness but not... Um, no, you shouldn't be cleaning up blood before law enforcement arrives. Seems a little like, two ends of the spectrum on, as far as the type of mindset that was going on during the incident. Yeah, he's stepping on her, the back yeah. of her leg with his bloody footprint. But he's like, can't leave cast off. Mm. <laughs> you know, come on. Yep. So I do want to talk more about a further blood stain pattern exam that had been ordered by the Durham Police Department. Basically, Dwayne Deaver built a full-scale replica of the Peterson stairwell um, at the SBI lab in Raleigh, North Carolina. So we, I, I want to talk about that, but let's take our last break before we dive into that. Did you know that in the last year, rates of anxiety and depression have doubled in the U.S.? These days, it can take months to get a traditional therapy appointment. But Cerebral is a 100% online mental health service that offers therapy and medication management for anxiety, depression, insomnia, stress, burnout, and more. Cerebral is here for anyone who's looking for help with their mental health, no matter where you are in your journey. Cerebral helps people with anxiety, depression, stress, insomnia, and more. If you feel like you're experiencing burnout or processing a major life event, Cerebral is care that's ready for you. It's 100% online. You take a brief questionnaire and get matched to a care team based off your needs and preferences. 
And through the Cerebral app, you can schedule your sessions, get your questions answered, and access additional mental health resources. Cerebral is one of the few services that also provides medication management online through a licensed provider if clinically indicated. Connect with their therapist on your own schedule through your laptop or the Cerebral mobile app, and you can really schedule sessions based on what's most convenient for you. You don't have to wait weeks to be seen. 80% of members see a provider within five days, and you can do your sessions on a laptop or a phone, so you can always find an area at home where you're most comfortable. Cerebral also has affordable treatments that are one-third the price of traditional therapy. Treatment options are available with or without insurance, and Cerebral is in-network with several insurers, and they're working every day to grow their partnership with in-network. Your monthly cost is even lower. Cerebral understands that finding a therapist isn't a linear journey. If your therapist isn't a match, Cerebral will help you find a provider that meets your needs. And 50% of Cerebral's clinicians self-identify as people of color. It's important to Cerebral to have the diversity so everyone can get the treatment that they deserve. So it's really important. I think that especially what what's ringing true with a lot of people now is burnout. A lot of people are working a lot, not going and taking as much care of themselves as they should. So more mental health is never a bad thing. Dara's going to tell you how you can get started with Cerebral today. Our listeners will receive 50% or more off your first month of therapy by going to Cerebral.com slash Crime Weekly. That's Cerebral.com slash Crime Weekly for 50% or more off your first month of therapy. For quality mental health care that's accessible and affordable, join Cerebral today. So a couple of things to mention about this replica was basically Dwayne Deaver decided that there had been at least two points of origin for the blood spatter. And there was an unstained area on the wall that measured approximately 10 inches long and 4 inches wide. And this area was surrounded by blood stains. So Dwayne Deaver said it was clear to him that this voided area had already been cleaned. However, he kind of figured this out after, you know, making the replica and kind of re-putting everything back together. So I'm not sure if they checked that voided area for blood stains with luminol or things like that. I don't think they did. The weird thing about the actual staircase, though, is even two years later, it still hadn't been cleaned, right? So like Kathleen's sister, I think it was Candace and Lori, they came and they like started cleaning the blood, but it was too hard for them. And Michael Peterson just ended up boarding up that staircase like from the top and bottom and like leaving it as is. And just they started using the other staircase. So that was always odd to me. But I will say that to me, that doesn't suggest somebody who's like guilty. <laughs> it suggests somebody who's like, I think that that if somebody actually knows how to read these blood stains, it will tell the true story of what happened. So I'm going to like leave it as is and, and board it up so that it can be looked at again. And they did bring the jury back during his trial to kind of stand in that stairwell and and see for themselves what it looked like, which I believe backfired because, like I said, all the blood was still there. By the time the trial started and the jury came to visit the Peterson home and see for themselves the stairwell, and there was just a lot of blood. And I think that they were very shocked by that. So I think it backfired for the defense team. Yeah, just by looking at some of the photos, I could see how that would be the case where you have normal citizens who are not exposed to this. They're being told certain things. They've seen photos, but there's no substitute for seeing it in person and to, to understand that what you're looking at and process it, that that's someone's blood um, and they sustained it during these injuries. And then you're thinking about they're getting a layout of the kitchen and where it happened and they're thinking to themselves, you know, in proximity where Michael would have been out by the pool and coming in here, how would he have not had heard her if she was yelling or heard some banging or whatever? They start to process their own thing because now they're putting themselves in the environment where it happened. Couple that with the amount of blood seen on the walls. Yeah, I could see how someone would leave that house going, no way, no way she fell down the stairs. Yeah, that's that's pretty much what happened. I think Dwayne Deaver's testimony combined with this like field trip to the Peterson home really cemented that in, in the jury's mind. But um, when you look at the diagram that Deaver kind of drew, 
there's step 16 and 17, which are going to be, you know, if you're going up the stairs, it's the second and third step. And there was blood in the corner of the wall above step 17. And then there was a line of blood spatter that ran above step 16 and 17. And that would match an area where a metal chairlift had been located. And for anybody who doesn't know, you know, elderly people or uh, disabled people will have these chairlifts so they can get up and down. Um, the stairs, it's just a little chair on a kind of a rail, and then the chair moves up the stairs and down the stairs. My grandfather had one. I tried to slide down it when I was young. It didn't feel good. It really, really hurt me. Um, my imaginary friend told me it would be a good idea, and it wasn't because there's like a thing at the bottom of it. It's not like a slide. There's like a little machine at the bottom of it. So the people who had owned the house before the Petersons had installed this, and it was still there when Kathleen fell down the stairs, and the chairlift device had blood on it and blood stains behind it. And based on the cleanup attempt that had happened using water or some other liquid, specifically on that bottom step where Kathleen's head had been when the first responders got there, and the rest of the blood stains, Deaver believed that Kathleen had been struck repeatedly and that her body had also been moved to several different positions. And he believed that as well because, remember, I kept saying there was finger-like stains and hair-like stains. So Deaver kind of believed that Kathleen's hair had blood in it, and as she was being moved, her hair was sort of like painting blood stains on the stairs and the wall. So during the trial, David Rudolph, Michael Peterson's attorney, stated the issues he had with Dwayne Deaver's recreated experiments that ended up bringing Deaver to the conclusion that Michael had beaten Kathleen to death with a fireplace blow poke. Deaver insisted that he wasn't trying to recreate the scene exactly. He was simply trying to see what impression blood leaves when it's dropped on a surface or wiped on a pair of shorts or beaten out of someone with a weapon. Dwayne Deaver told the jury, quote, a forceful impact occurred on step number 16. It was an impact on the surface and the back of the head of the victim came in contact forcibly. It is consistent with something more forceful than a fall. End quote. At the end of the day, Deaver said he believed that Kathleen had been hit on the back of the head at least three times and that the back of her head had also hit two wooden stairs. Based on the evidence, he believed her husband Michael had been standing right over her when she was killed, not sitting outside enjoying the mild weather and smoking his pipe. An attacker had struck Kathleen with a weapon, like the missing blow poke, the attacker had been standing outside the stairwell. Kathleen then fell forward onto the stairs where she was hit twice more in the back of her head. Kathleen attempted to stand up, and at one point she was standing up, and then her head forcibly hit two more steps. As Kathleen continued to bleed out, someone began cleaning the scene. Deaver would tell the jury, quote, there should have been blood stains on step number 17. In my opinion, the blood had been purposely removed after the victim came to rest on step number 18, end quote. So not only did someone clean up the stairs, but they had also tried to clean themselves up, which is why he said there was a blood stain on Michael Peterson's shorts that was diluted in a V-shape. And he didn't say that Michael Peterson did this to hide the fact that he had blood on him, but to alter the blood stains so that somebody like Dwayne Deaver wouldn't be able to tell whether that blood had come from like transfer or whether it had come from, you know, an impact that caused the blood to go up towards him. You know, do we know if I know what he's saying where it should be, but I'm, I'm going to assume that luminol testing was done. And just to refer back to a case that you mentioned before, Daniel Redlick, it's something where you see the blood. But then when you do further testing, if you were to go under a luminol test with it, you spray everywhere, whether it's blood or a cleaning agent that was used to clean up the area, that place would be lighting up like a glow stick. They'd be blood, especially with that amount of blood. So do you know if they ever conducted that type of test where under a luminol test, under the black light, there was obviously the blood that was seen by the human eye, but then under a luminol test, there was just blood everywhere where you would see the smearing throughout that whole hallway and maybe potentially throughout the kitchen and wherever else Michael may have walked if this was something that he did intentionally to try to throw off law enforcement. So I'll correct myself if I'm wrong next episode, but from what I could tell, luminol was not used on that stairwell or in that hallway. Luminol was used 
throughout the kitchen, like going to the laundry room, because remember they said they saw like footprints, like bloody footprints when they put the luminol down. But in that situation, they allegedly put the luminol down, saw the footprints, but didn't take photographs of the footprints in the luminol. So it was just like, um, you know, somebody's word because he like drew a picture of where the footprints went. And then the defense was like, well, where are these footprints? You know, show me the pictures that you took of the footprints that that were lighting up in Luminol. And they were like, well, we didn't do that. We just drew a picture of of what they looked like and where they went. We didn't take pictures. So they didn't they did the Luminol there, but it didn't look like they did the Luminol in the hallway or on the stairwell because at the end of the day, they took pictures of that. And then using those pictures, Dwayne Deaver replicated that in his like fake, you know, fake staircase at the the SBI lab. And from there, he's saying, well, there should be blood here. But because there's no blood here, it looks like it was cleaned up. And that's what must have happened. Yeah, I think the luminol would have just emphasized that where you would have said, yeah, there should be blood here. And not only that, when we put under a luminol test, there was signs of blood or a cleaning agent that was used to wipe the blood that should have been there. But I, I in defense of their, them, I will say, Michael admitted to cleaning up the crime the crime scene to right. a certain degree with paper towels. Yeah. So uh, there's a lot of smearing in there that's very obvious to even the human eye. And mm-hmm. he's not denying that. If he went mm-hmm. in there and said, uh, yeah, I came in here. I've been sitting by my wife the entire time. I have not moved since the time that I've discovered her. And there's a smearing all over the place and the signs of cleaning up. Well, then that's a that's a sign of deception. He's lying. He obviously did. Someone cleaned up before they got there. So the fact that he's admitting that doesn't necessarily mean he's innocent. He may be admitting it because there's no way to hide it because he's looking around and seeing the obvious signs of a cleanup. Even if that's the case, as I said in episode one, and I'll stick to it no matter where I end up falling on this one, the idea of cleaning up any blood in any area and before law enforcement or the ambulance even arrives is absolutely bonkers to me. It's either a sign that he is a criminal and he did exactly what a lot of people think he did, or he just is out of his mind because i don't know the uh, if you took 100 people and surveyed them i think 99 out of 100 if not 100 out of 100 would say the last thing on my mind is cleaning up the blood from my loved one when there's a chance they can still be saved i agree but there's gonna be people who say well you can't tell how people are going to act when they're mourning way down in the comments let's do a little let's do an unofficial poll here how many of you i'll even go this far you walk in you find your loved one they're they're dying so you're staying with them at that point because you don't you're trying to help them trying to keep them awake at some point while you're waiting for first responders to arrive your loved one dies you know it they stop breathing they're dead you call back to dispatch and say my loved one is deceased which he did right Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at that point even though that just that, that just occurred and you know you there's nothing you can do to save them where are you thinking about grabbing anything to clean up the blood around them at that point? Is that anywhere on your radar as far as, you know what, I might want to clean up a little blood before they get here because this is this is a mess. I want to hear if you do believe that. We're, no judgment here. Nobody come at anybody. But maybe there are people who do feel that way. And if you do, please tell me why. Because I can't think of a reason. Maybe there's something in the comment where you're like, hey, this would be the reason for it. And maybe you change my mind. I'm open. No judgment, man. But he said, if you do that, you're out of your mind. I did say that, didn't I? Yeah. Yeah. yeah sorry. You are. <laughs> I, don't <know. laughs> I, I don't know what to tell you. I'm sorry. You got me. I'm on recording here. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think you got to reorganize your priorities if they're like, oh, let me clean up a little bit before they get here. This is kind of, this is nasty. I, I, this is embarrassing. Yeah. I don't want anybody <laughs> slipping and falling before they, when they come in here. That's crazy. But I don't want um, anybody to think I live like this. <laughs> yeah. And, and not to make light of it, that's where it comes for me. It's not necessarily the lack of blood in certain locations that's suspicious to me. It's the idea that he would even, Michael, would even consider cleaning up the blood in the first place. So there's still a problem with what happened in that stairwell, whether it was an accident or intentional. It's still questionable. I just don't know if the lack of blood, you could automatically assume that it was cleaned up when you can't see it and there was no test to definitively determine there had been blood there that was cleaned up before law enforcement arrived. Yeah, I think it's more likely that he cleaned up the blood and then was like, because he was suspicious and he was like, oh, it looks suspicious if I say I didn't clean up this blood because it's obvious. So I'm going to say I cleaned up the blood, but I'm not going to say why, you know? Okay. Right? Because if he did something wrong and he tried to clean it up, that is kind of a first reaction. 
But then he realized like, oh, it's going to look like I tried to clean this up. But if it was just an accident, I don't see why he would try to clean it up. Yeah, I I don't either. I agree. And I've been I mean, if I'm to like replay this episode in my head, I would say I was leaning towards accident or the way my questioning and comments have been. But I will tell you, that's a big problem for me. I know we've talked about some more physical evidence with the the injuries and all that stuff. And that's very important. But sometimes the most simple things are the things that bug you the most. And the idea of cleaning up uh, your wife's blood so early in it when there's still a chance that she can be saved just seems crazy to me that you would leave her side at any point to go grab a paper towel or a towel when she's still there. And you're not a doctor. You don't know for certain that she's gone. You You being there you know, talking to her, whatever might be the thing that keeps her alive. So to put her down uh, and leave her there alone just makes no sense to me. Yeah, I agree. And, uh, you know, but once again, this is just talking about how somebody's reacting and what their emotional state is. We can't say. That's true. We absolutely can't say any more than we can say what happened to that stairwell because we weren't there. But just our opinion, it's weird. And if he could, you know, Michael, if you're listening and you want to give a call in and and explain your thought process, we will definitely entertain it. By the way, this isn't a knock. I think we both can agree on the surface. Michael's a weird guy. So it's not completely out of the realm. And that's not a knock. It really isn't. But he's he's an interesting guy, to say the least. So maybe that's his character. I don't know. You know, there's quirky people out there. I don't know what the rationale would be, but maybe if we heard it directly for him from him, it would make sense. I don't know, because that's just the way his brain works. I don't know. Yeah. I'm open to it. If he wants to explain it, I am yeah, open I to hearing it. Don't hold your breath. <laughs> well, for the defense, we have forensic pathologist, Dr. Henry Lee, who testified that after 240 hours of studying the crime scene, the photos, and visiting the SBI lab to view Dwayne Deaver's replica, he concluded that the evidence told him this was more likely to have been an accidental fall. The blow poke the prosecution was insisting had been used to beat Kathleen to death would have been about four feet long. The opening to the stairwell was about 81 inches high, and Michael Peterson was five foot nine. If Michael was swinging the blow poke where Dwayne Deaver claimed he stood when he first attacked Kathleen, wouldn't the weapon have struck the header? of the stairwell opening. Henry Lee testified that the blood spatter at the scene and on Kathleen and even on Michael's own shorts could have been caused by a wide variety of factors, telling the jury, quote, could be coughing, could be anything that projects the blood, end quote. Basically, the blood spatter could have been formed when blood from Kathleen's head and face ran into her mouth and then she coughed the blood out. When DA Jim Harden asked why Dr. Lee hadn't tested hair samples for DNA, or tested the blood that was on the wall to see if there was saliva in it, Dr. Lee responded, quote, that's not my job, that's your job, end quote. Ouch. Dr. Lee said that the Durham police and the SBI had done a good job with the case, but he had a different opinion than they did. He said he couldn't exclude everything, but he felt the scene was just more consistent with a fall than with a beating. And Lee talked about Dwayne Deaver and his full-scale model of the stairway. He referred to it as child's play. And when D.A. Jim Harden went for Lee again, saying, quote, didn't you tell Dwayne Deaver that he'd done some of the best work you had seen? End quote. Henry Lee responded, quote, no, I tell him it was the best model I had seen. End quote. Harden then pulled out a copy of Henry Lee's book, which is called Henry Lee's Crime Scene Handbook. This was a copy of the book that Henry Lee had given Dwayne Deaver, and inside he had written in it, to Dwayne Deaver, one of the best, keep up the good work. Warm regards, Henry Lee. And so Jim Harden was like, well, you wouldn't have written that unless you thought he was one of the best. And Lee responded, quote, no, no, no. I give everyone courtesy, Chinese courtesy. I went to his place. He extended the courtesy. Let me see what he has. It's my upbringing. You can't write in there something like you are totally wrong, end quote. In Henry Lee's opinion, the blood that Deaver had thought was cast off could have come from coughing, sneezing, wheezing, or from Kathleen's hair. And he kind of used the example of like a dog when it gets wet and it shakes and the blood like spatters all over. He also used a mouthful of diluted ketchup to elaborate and show the jury this. He showed the jury close-up pictures of Kathleen's face with blood stained around her lips and mouth, proving that blood had been around her mouth area. And then he said that there was far too much blood in the stairwell for Kathleen to have been beaten. 
On top of that, since the prosecution was stuck on the blowpoke as a weapon idea, you'd expect to see blood cast off onto the ceiling, but there was none. Now, once again, we already kind of talked about this. I touched on it. But when Dwayne Deaver was asked about this, he said, well, there's no cast off on the ceiling because Michael could have wiped the blowpoke off on his shirt before and after every strike. Now, also, according to the autopsy, Kathleen did have alcohol and Valium in her system. The defense argued that she'd slipped and fallen accidentally because she was disoriented from these two substances. And like I said, Dwayne Deaver and the prosecution believed she'd been attacked and beaten to death, that the scene had been cleaned and staged. And Deaver goes on to like really like elaborate on this. And he says, listen, there was blood on the kitchen cabinet that contained the wine glasses. Those stains were finger like and they'd been found on the knob. Below that cabinet, there was a drop of blood on the kitchen counter. Near the sink, there were two wine glasses and an open bottle of wine. But inside the sink, there was a large pasta pot and a food strainer covering the drain. And when Deaver removed the strainer, he said he noticed a strong smell of alcohol, as if a lot of wine had been poured down the drain, even maybe even a whole bottle, he said. And I just completely disagree with this. First of all, he's a blood spatter expert. So what are you talking about? A strong smell of alcohol. He's basically saying they didn't even drink wine. Michael poured the bottle of wine down the sink. This doesn't even match the evidence. She had she had alcohol in her system. And, you know, Todd and Christina. Yeah, they, yeah, they, they saw, saw her, her drinking. drinking. Right. So like when he goes off on these tangents like this, and first of all, all you have to do is pour half a glass of wine down the sink and you'll have a strong alcohol smell. I do it all the time. I know it is very strong no matter how much wine you're pouring down the sink. But like the fact that you're even arguing that this wine was staged and you keep coming back to this when there's people who saw her drinking and she had alcohol in her system just shows me that you want to ignore all the evidence that doesn't align with your narrative. And that's con- that's concerning when you're supposed to be like a scientific expert who's unbiased. Well, you're, you're overstepping your area of expertise, right? When you're starting to weigh in on other things uh, and speculate as to why things may have occurred the way they did, just stick to the facts. Stick to what you stick to what you know. And I want to come back to that infamous blow poke now. The instrument that the prosecution had been waving in front of the jury from the very first day of the trial. One of Dwayne's Deaver's tests had even been to hit a blood-soaked sponge that was supposed to represent Kathleen's head with a blowpoke over 30 times until he got the exact blood spatter that he saw on Michael's shorts. He had to do that, I think, 38 times before he got that, that blood spatter. And then they played this video for the jury. Now, it seemed like every time Jim Harden or the other prosecutor, Freda Black, were addressing the jury, they kept saying, where is the blowpoke? Where is the blowpoke? But then David Rudolph, he strolled into court one day holding the blowpoke. Now, the story with this blowpoke is interesting because when it was suggested by the prosecution that this could be the murder weapon and that it was missing, Michael Peterson did search his home for it, but nothing turned up. Now, remember, the police claimed they'd already looked for it and they couldn't find it. Towards the end of the trial, Michael's son Clayton was working on his 1966 Mustang in the garage of the Peterson home, and he happened to come across the blowpoke. It was in a dark corner covered up with cobwebs. So Clayton went and got his sister, Margaret Ratliff, and it was nighttime. So they both went in. They woke up Michael. Michael called his lawyers. The lawyers called the judge on the case. The judge went to Michael's house and made sure that the blowpoke was photographed and sent for testing. And this testing revealed that it must have been in the garage for some time since it was covered with cobwebs. And besides that, there was no sign that it had been used in a murder. It wasn't bent or broken, and the lab test came back negative for blood. So after the blowpoke was found, the prosecution never said the word blowpoke again, but it gets worse. Years after Michael Peterson was convicted and sentenced to prison, it came out that the police had found the blowpoke in the basement during their initial search of the home in early 2002. They had taken it out of the basement along with some other items, and they brought those items outside and photographed those items outside in the daylight and then put them back into the house, but they must have put the blowpoke in the garage. The police had dismissed the blowpoke as being a possible murder weapon, but the pictures they had taken of the blowpoke were in the file that the prosecution had. But those photos were not turned over during discovery to the defense team. Now, I'm not saying that the prosecution knew those pictures were there. I'm not saying they even knew that the police had found the blowpoke early on. But it is the job of the police, as you know, 
to make sure that the DA knows everything that the police know. And if we were able to prove that the DA's office knew the blowpoke wasn't missing and that they had seen pictures of it and chosen not to turn those over to the defense team, that would be a Brady violation. And I think yep. it's I think it's pretty I, I I OK, just my supposition. I think they knew. I think they knew that the police had found that freaking no, blowpoke. You would. Yeah. And I guess I would I would automatically think they didn't because I think that if it were something nefarious, they probably would have made sure any evidence that they had taken photos of those the blowpoke wasn't left in the file. So either they're either no, they're really... then they're destroying evidence. Like that's complete. You can't feign ignorance if you like actively destroyed evidence. I, I think if they if they purposely are leaving something out, you're gonna make you're gonna go all the way and make sure there's no no trace of it left. But we knew we were going to differ on that one, right? You're going to no, no. We, we shouldn't that. differ. We shouldn't differ on that one, dude. You're telling me none of the police officers who remember taking pictures and finding the blowpoke and hearing the word blowpoke every single freaking day of that trial weren't like blowpoke. Oh, I actually remember finding a blowpoke. I remember taking pictures of it. This is. I wonder if it's the same blowpoke. Nobody put two and two together. How did how did come out? How did come out that that was the story behind it? Because the blowpoke was found and the blowpoke didn't tell. The defense. Hey, by the way, there were photos taken of me. You might want to look into. The- so, who eventually uh, divulged this information? Oh, I don't know. It was like 2018, but they they've never denied it. They just said they didn't know. So I'm saying so. It had to be the prosecution that came forward and said, "Your Honor, we have something." Or it was that the we- police? Yeah, they were the like, police came to yeah. them and said, "Listen, we got to tell you something." Joe Schmo over here it was in this. He came forward and told us that he actually took photos of it. We screwed up. You got it. And now prosecution's like, "Hey, we got to." We got to tell the court about this. We can't. We can't keep this under wraps. Listen, I, I'll, I'll say it's possible. Of course, it is that they completely op- tried to do this on purpose. It was a Brady violation, and and they didn't want to turn it over to the defense, but accidentally left the photos of the blowpoke in the file that was turned over to prosecution. Dude, get this: when they found the blowpoke and they brought it in, Jim Harden, he's like, "Oh, listen, okay, they found the blowpoke, but I will also tell you that a woman." who owns this blowpoke company, called me and said Michael Peterson ordered three blowpokes from her, so this could be one of those. But like, they were still trying. And then Michael Peterson and David Rudolph are like, yeah, we ordered the blowpokes because like, we were doing testing just like you guys were doing, testing to try to you know like take your testing off the table and disprove your testing. But like, this is not the same blowpoke, you know, the, the, this blow, like, what are you talking about? They still were like stuck on the freaking blowpoke because they had hung their hats on it so hard that I think at some point during that trial, they remembered or found out the blowpoke had been photographed and they were like, well, we, what are we going to do? We got to literally die on this hill, man. It is so, so shady and so sketchy. And that's what I'm saying. Like Michael Peterson could a million percent be guilty. I kind of think he is. But when you got antics like this clouding the waters, like muddying the waters, who's the bad guy here? Who's the bad guy? everyone when you're doing a murder investigation i know in every case mistakes happen when you're doing a case this big mistake man the significant it's super it's it's embarrassing it's embarrassing and we were talking about uh the idaho police case and you know on the surface we, we might learn there were mistakes made there too but on the surface it looks like they did a great job so i had this high tonight where i was like praising good police work and then you hit me with this and you just bring me down. Why would that bring you down? Like Because it's, just... it's representative of all of us. You know, it's one of those things where this is our job, you know, and you know this going into it. And I do agree with you where while this is going on at trial and prosecution is bringing up, like you said, the blow poke. By the way, if you played my game tonight, get yourself to a hospital because you are going to die from alcohol poisoning blow poke. by the amount of times <laughs> a blow poke was said. But to hear this multiple times and this not to come forward. At some point, someone with half a brain got a hold of this information and went to the prosecution and said, hey, listen, I know this ain't going to be good for you, but we got to fill you in on some things that happened behind closed doors. Um, So and so let's say it was a detective who took the photos and he's like, oh, shit, I should have put this in a report and I didn't. I'm just going to be quiet for now. But then it gets out. That is, by definition, a Brady violation. As soon as you realize there's something, you have to turn it over. So I'm definitely acknowledging It could be the case. It also could be a situation where you have so many people, so many cooks in the kitchen that it slips through the cracks. And I will say it's inexcusable because the blowpoke was such a big part of this case. This wasn't like some insignificant piece of evidence. This was the main character in the story. 
and you forgot that you found it and took photos of it. Mm hmm. It's it's embarrassing. I don't know what else you want me to say. I'm I'm owning that. It's embarrassing. Okay, I would argue that another possible Brady violation is a letter that the medical examiner Deborah Radish wrote to her boss, Chief Medical Examiner John Butts. And remember, Deborah Radish did uh, Kathleen's autopsy, and in this letter, Deborah Radish basically says, "Like, listen, I don't really feel comfortable saying that Kathleen Peterson died from blunt force trauma." And her boss, John Butts, responded basically like, well, that that's what we're saying. OK, that's that's the party line. That's what's being said. And there's evidence that the prosecutor, Frida Black, was aware of this exchange between Deborah Radish and John Butts. And she did not disclose that to the defense. So, you know, that's a Brady violation, I think. I wonder if it would be, because if it's not something. So if there's a is it, if there's a private conversation, right, if there's a private conversation between uh, you know, colleagues where they're they're debating uh, what's going to happen here. You know, listen, I, I've had conversations with colleagues where it's like, what do you think in here? What would the charge be? What do we have for statutes? And we might go back and forth where I'm saying, hey, I think we can hit them with this, this and this. And they're like, no. And then ultimately, my lieutenant, who's above me in rank as a sergeant, can say, listen, I'm looking at what you're saying. I hear you, but I disagree. I'm in charge. This is what we're going with as a team, as a, as out of my office, that's what we're going with. And so I could see a world where there was a discussion between the chief medical examiner and, and obviously Deborah Radish. And ultimately they went with his decision because he looked at the body as well. He might've done his own analysis of the report and said, this is what's coming out of my office. Now, if there was a letter written by Deborah Radish or any type of form filled out by her where she, you know, divulges this information because she wanted a, a written report of her findings and her opinions, and that wasn't ret- turned over to the defense, then uh, yeah, clearly that's a clear Brady violation. But you're saying that it's 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 speculated that Frida Black knew about this conversation, right? There's been nothing to prove it. Frida Black knew about this conversation, and she didn't turn it over to the defense, and it's not her decision to decide whatever is material or exculpatory. You have to turn everything over to the defense, just like that one dude, I forget his name, but the first guy who kind of wrote like, oh, I think this looks accidental, and then later changed his mind. That way the defense can now look at that dude and be like, hey, you changed your mind. Why did you change your mind? You know, you should know that the medical examiner, the person that the jury's going to look at who says like, this absolutely was not an accident, this was absolutely blunt force trauma, initially wrote to her boss and said, I don't know how comfortable I feel putting this on the actual like, you know, autopsy report. And he was like, just do it. And Mm. the prosecuting attorney knew about that. That's a Brady violation. Like you don't get to decide what's material and what's exculpatory. You have to hand everything over during discovery and you don't have to bring their attention to it. Right. Like, you know, she wouldn't have had to have been like here, um, David Rudolph, just so you know, here's something that's really going to help you. you. Just throw it in. They give them 10 million boxes, man. You hope they don't find it. But if they, Mm. you know, you got to give them the chance to find it. And here is a a specific sign along with, you know, the whole blow poke pictures where they're just like, "Mm, this doesn't really fit our narrative. So we're going to just pretend we didn't see it or we're just going to ignore it. And it's like shoddy. And it's like, once again, who's the bad guy here? Who's the bad guy? You're supposed to be like on Kathleen's side. How can you be on her side when you're consistently doing stupid shit that in eight years is going to get Michael Peterson an Alfred plea. Mm. It's two hours and a half into it, so I'm going to agree to disagree with you and move on. Yeah, let's let's end it. Let's end it. <laughs> I'm a, Jesus. Guys, as always, we appreciate you guys joining us here. Follow us on our social media. We had mentioned Crime Weekly News at the beginning. Make sure if you're listening on audio, you subscribe, put notifications on on YouTube. It's a YouTube only thing right now, and it's going to be that way for the foreseeable future. If you want to follow us on social media, you can go to Crime Weekly Pod on Twitter and Instagram. You can find out all the updates there. We also have a Patreon page. We've started to add new things to it where we're releasing these videos early to our Patreon watchers, if you want to put it that way, because it's only YouTube. We also, if you subscribe to the channel, you will see that. We have some merch stores coming out in the foreseeable future, and there's going to be a discount associated exclusively with our Patreon members. So, as always, we appreciate you joining us here. Thank you guys so much for being here. We will see you next week for some more stimulating conversation. Bye. Bye. Bye.